Is it time? It is time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. We'll know in a very short period of time, but it looks like it could be something that will be uh, not good. Believe me, not good. Um, so, uh, you know, I see issue with yeah, that. And okay, again, yeah, you're, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, 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 hey. Uh, you're not going to be able to insult your way to the presidency. That's not going to happen. I don't know who created Pokemon Go. But I'm trying to figure out how we get them to have Pokemon go to the polls. I'm Ted Cruz, and my pronoun is kiss my ass. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do to lay these wires, hey, 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 hey. what we need to do <laughs> to create these jobs. We will not get you. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in the foot him in uh, foot, foot. Not good. Believe me, not good. Hello, dissidents. Welcome, everyone, one and all, to the Do Dissidents podcast. My name is Keaton Weiss here, of course, with Russell Dobular. Hello. I want to thank you all very much for being here tonight, starting out the program with 500 strong in the YouTube chat. And uh, we've got a couple hundred filing in. Last I checked over on Rumble. So thank you guys all for being here. We have a wonderful show for you tonight. And just uh, a reminder, after the show this evening, since it is Sunday, we do have our post-show Q and A talk back that is exclusively on Rumble. So if you're on Rumble right now, stay where you are after the show. If you're on YouTube right now, switch to Rumble after the show. Rumble.com front slash do dissidents. But we have a lot to talk about between now and then, and we have a very special guest to come talk with us. He is an author of books such as Insane Cloud, Insane Clown President, pardon me, Griftopia, The Divide and Hate Inc. He is also the editor at Racket News on Substack, where he also writes, coming back to the show, making his sophomore appearance on the Do Dissidents podcast, Matt Taibbi. Matt, good to see you again. Good to see you, Keaton. How's it going? How's it going, Russell? Good. How are you, Matt? Good, good. Good, and that will double as our second sound check, because I know you switch mics during the countdown. So beautiful. <laughs> we can hear you loud and clear. Good, good, good. Excellent. Well, yeah, thanks uh, so much for being here. It's great to see you again. A lot has happened since you were last here. When you were last here, you were here to talk about the Twitter files, and your life has only gotten more interesting since then. Uh, who'd have thought that the Twitter files would not be the the peak? You, it would actually get crazier for you since then. Yeah, it's been a weird year. This is exactly uh, a year and a day since the first Twitter files. and uh, Wow. And it's been... It's been pretty strange and very frustrating, gentlemen, I'll have to tell you. I mean, I, for the most part in my life, um, I haven't taken this job personally, but uh, the, the last year of, not, of watching like the sort of ACLU, traditional ACLU liberal crowd completely blow off this story has been kind of maddening uh, it's gotten to me personally in a way that like nothing i've ever done before um has and i don't know maybe you can explain it to me it's been uh, i don't know <laughs> so i uh, ho hope we can talk about that a little bit because uh, uh, that's part of the backstory to this week too so absolutely uh, well, uh that's definitely in our wheelhouse matt <laughs> yeah. it's certainly in our wheelhouse and you know when we were setting up this interview you mentioned how uh you know you anticipated a very unpleasant time uh d down in washington dc when you testified uh for the house um and uh, we watched hang on kid okay, okay, before we get into that All matt right. what kind of music did you like in high school <laughs> uh it Everything. I listened to a lot of rap and hip hop because I grew up playing a lot of street basketball, and that was kind of where I started. But I listened to everything, you know. But now what? that I'm playing drums, I do. I play a lot of like stuff like Nirvana and Led Zeppelin. Believe it or not, I mean it's it's a little embarrassing, but um, you yeah. listen to any Maiden? Uh, Iron Maiden. Uh huh. Oh yeah. How, how did you know that? 
uh, well, we have a certain tradition here and we hit 666. So take out your headbanging skills, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's when we hit 666 in the chat. Beautiful. That's excellent. Yeah. No, I, I, was, I was actually just, uh, I was just learning Run to the Hills about two weeks Oh, ago. really? That's a, that's a hard song. Yeah, it is a hard song. I'm not, you gotta be fast for that one. So that's the, You were yeah. taken for a loop when he first asked you. I'm surprised they didn't teach you that in journalism school. When we're starting an interview, the co-host is supposed to cut off uh, his partner mid-question and say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, what kind of music you listen to in high school? <laughs> Yeah, well, I wasn't, uh, that one that wasn't teed up all that well. No, no, no you must have skipped that day. I mean, I know yeah, they exactly. teach it. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but I like that tradition—that's a good tradition. Man. <laughs> but it was one of those things. Like if I didn't hit it at that moment, it, it would have been gone. The you crowd would have gotten Eddie restless. They want it, you know. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's where's, true. Where, where are the Eddie T-shirts? If you're going to do that, don't you need the iron, the, the maiden shirts? Uh, I, you know, I've been invited by one of our viewers to go to his like private box for the maiden show next year. Nice. nice. Actually, nice. that was, that was the first concert I ever saw on my own. Really? Iron, Ma Iron Maiden with quiet riot opening. Where? Madison square garden. I was 13 and I was so young. I literally paid for it with change out of my piggy bank <laughs> in quarters. Hmm. <laughs> 1350 that's how much the ticket was i'll never forget because it was paid in quarters that is excellent that's excellent i i, I saw i saw a maiden across the street at um at radio city and there was a guy smoking a joint with that that was rolled with typing paper it was that it was that big <laughs> I'd, I'd never seen anything like that before in my life it was amazing. <laughs> great show yeah they put on a great show they do they do yeah. yeah, they're on a big tour next fall, I guess, right? That's the tour? <laughs> no, it's November. Arena's cool. Um, well, yeah, you were mentioning when we were setting this up how, you know, you were kind of dreading going back to Washington, having to do round two with, you know, Plaskett and Wasserman Schultz and Dan Goldman. Was Dan Goldman in Congress the first time or is he well, new? Yeah. He was. Yeah. He was there, right? Yeah. Um, that's right, because that was earlier this year. That was March. Um, or no, that was since. That was yeah, later. That was it yeah, it was that right. Um, yes. So you mentioned how that was going to be, you know, this drag of an experience, and you know, I, I'm, I'm sure it was. But the universe did throw you a bone by shit canning Mehdi Hassan at MSNBC. Yeah. He was canceled. <laughs> hey, you know what? I can't even. I can't even feel like glee about that because. Yeah, I don't know. I mean. He, He's kind of. A, I think he should be speaking out a little bit about why they can't. They fired him. So that just speaks to his character a little bit. I mean, I, um, you know, Medi got me good in that interview. I mean, and that's the, the, all's fair in love and war. And I was not prepared, and, and he was, and he's good at that shit. That's like that, that's what he where he makes his living. But it was the stuff that happened afterward that got me angry. Where you know he was trying to get me uh, sewn up over. It was really a mistake on their part and you know like yeah he implied you had perjured yourself i mean it really went just yeah, exactly. crazy i mean i think that there's there's ambitious and then there's a level beyond that where where he lives and um i i've never really understood people who are like that uh but you know uh I, although i just can't take that much pleasure in, in his uh in his firing no I, I did see that happen i think as the as the um uh the event the, the testimony was taking place though it was that day right i i would think so it was earlier this week so whenever that was we did the show wednesday so i think it was tuesday that it happened oh okay all right yeah. um but well, yeah, did, I mean, didn't it's one of aoc things. jumped on that too didn't she aoc after yeah. after the media sign she's oh he should be tried for perjury yeah yeah and then we heard like the whole leadership was in on that whole thing and um you know, that, that's why I was fully expecting that they were going to try to lead me into some kind of questioning that was designed to get me wrapped up in some kind of contempt of Congress charge. Right. Um, right. But they clearly got um, some kind of a PR uh, advisory uh, from, you know, probably from some Burson Marsteller type firm. Um, and they just did, they didn't engage us at all. 
uh, except for Dan Goldman, who who did, I think, just because his personality right. wouldn't let it go. Uh, right. The rest of them didn't even look at us. All they did was they, they had this other witness, Olivia Troy, there, uh, whose entire purpose was to talk about how bad Donald Trump was. And this is, you know, the Democratic Party's answer to everything is always but Trump. But this was like a like a parody version of that. Where <laughs> yes. They were holding like a separate uh, hearing to just move over to like, yeah, but Trump. Um, every time they, you know, they had time on the clock, and it, it, again, it's just I, I would, I would love to hear what the real answer is. Like, what, why are you behind this stuff? And and now, now I think we know. Like, this is their project. They want this. This is an important part of what they're trying to establish. And I think we have we have to let go of the illusion that there's anything left to the Democratic Party to appeal to. It's just it's not there anymore. Is that all right? I mean, I don't know. Uh, uh, no, no, yeah. I mean, it was a, a really funny moment to me. I can't remember which congressman it was, but he was questioning Troy. It was, I can't even remember it was a man or a woman, but they were so leading her into invoking Hitler. It was like, oh my God. And who does that remind you of? <laughs> <laughs> you <know? laughs> and she's like, the evil Hitler. <laughs> and she said something like, I'm pretty sure that's what she said, the evil Hitler. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, it was the guy from Massachusetts. I forget what his what his um his name is. He's the, but but yeah, he he gave her the vermin setup, and she didn't take the cue that you know every MSNBC anchor has already said five thousand times in the last right, right. Um, she, apparently she watches the wrong channel in her off time. Um, so they had to go back. They had to like on the re, on the rebound. Right, right. Tell her here's right. what the answer is. Uh, Who does that remind you of? <laughs> you know, it was no, it was it, it was ridiculous. And you're right. I mean, it was so clear that they had gotten PR advice. Right. Like, listen, you got mocked from one end of the internet to the other for your last attempts to go after these guys. Just pretend they're not there and talk about Donald Trump. Right. And minimize the in the in Twitter files by constantly comparing it to other things that you claim are more important than freedom of speech in America. Minimize it by comparison. Well, right. And and so the one interesting thing is that the, you know, in March when we testified, the argument was still being made that this was not really happening, that right. this was a, cons you know, just a ridiculous conspiracy theory. The FBI had put out a statement, if, if you remember, and um, you know, in December, like the, there are conspiracy theorists on the internet who are saying that we did something wrong. And obviously this isn't true that, and that was sort of the party line. Now this has been adjudicated in court. It's going to be in the Supreme court. We've had four federal judges say, we think, we think this is very likely in violation of the first amendment. We're letting this injunction stand because of that. Uh, well, now it's being repealed for other right. reasons, but, um, so they can't say it's not happening. So instead they've moved on to, well, you know, it's a, either it's a good thing or we need, I mean, that, that that's the implication, right? right. With, with all this stuff. Oh, Donald Trump is so scary um, that we need, we need to have these tools in place to prevent Hitler. Um, right. But they don't defend the program. They don't defend what they're talking about. They just say that. So this is very frustrating. Well, you mentioned how, you know, the Democratic Party is, is totally hopeless, and this is a large reason why, and I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, but the Israel war has really kind of fractured some of the alliances or at least short-term partnerships that, like, some of us on the left have made with those sort of across the aisle on the subject of speech. Like, we've seen a lot of, you know, right-of-center, you know, supposed free speech champions sort of reveal themselves to be very one-sided in their commitments while a lot of you know left-wing or liberal anti-free speech sort of 
bullies like Ahmedi Hassan, you know, right down to, I would argue, like the rank and file student bodies at these Ivy League universities, right? Very pro-censorship until they get censored for protesting the Israel war. We've seen student peace groups get suspended from schools and things like that. And some on the right, not all, but some of the right uh, have cheered that on, calling them, you know, terrorist sympathizers and stuff like that. So do you have any observations about that sort of crackdown on like campus speech, uh, pro-Palestine speech, pro-ceasefire speech? And um, I guess the B part of that would be, you know, as someone like yourself who's been branded both left and right wing, <laughs> uh, depending on who's doing the branding and when, uh, how can we build like meaningful, long lasting cross-partisan consensus in, de in defense of the actual principle of free speech? I mean, that's a great question, right? I mean, it was even worse than that. I mean, so, so some country just outright banned, you know, protests. Yeah, in France, they right? said, you're not allowed here. In Germany, they didn't technically ban it, but the cops would break up every protest that they could find until it got too big, which thankfully many of them did. Exactly, yeah. And then there were, there were, there were some campuses that were doing similar things right here in the States. Um, and this is... It was a little frustrating for me because this is one of the things that I've been saying all along is that, uh, you know, this, this kind of censorship um, affects Palestinians. It has for years. Glenn wrote about this. Glenn Greenwald wrote about this in 2016. That was actually one of the first times that we saw this deal, which is implicit in this kind of um, censorship where, uh, you know, a company like Facebook Facebook in Palestine is like the only media that there is. That's it's the only functioning way that people can communicate with each other, get news. And so when uh, Facebook made a deal basically with the Mossad, and I, I think it was 2015, 2016, and they ended up having an arrangement where I, Glenn reported it was 95% of requests were fulfilled um, in 2016. And that was the first. That was the first of these arrangements, and we saw it even with uh, the CTI files that we we did, uh, you know, a week ago, earlier this week, that Michael Schellenberger and I wrote. Um, you know, there was there was a free free uh, Palestine hashtag. There was uh, the um, UNCPR. Uh, it's what's an, it's another American, you know, pro Palestinian organization. They were being monitored as as, as a threat. So it's, it's not just a right-wing thing, and this is always the case, but the problem is, man, you th we thought at this whole experience of the last three or four years had, had finally convinced Republicans, like, you know, you got to stay on the principle on this thing because look at how hard you can be hit with this. Right. And the instant this happened, you saw there's this massive defection of people who'd been saying the exact opposite for the last two, three years. And that's, you know, it's pretty upsetting. Although I still think a large part of the, of the caucus is going to end up being, um, you know, on, on the pro-free speech side, at least through the 2024 election, uh, because they're scared of another election integrity partnership type of thing developing. But I don't know. I don't know. What, what's your conclusion about that? Because I think you're right. Like they've managed to rope in people, um, you know, on both sides. And partly, it's a generational thing. There's just both left and right. There just isn't that kind of tradition of respecting free speech and respecting free dialogue anymore. Yeah, I well, think some people <clears throat> see it. Sorry, Russell. I, I think some no, people see it. Like I thought. Tucker Carlson, when he spoke about this, not as it pertains to the Israel war, but he's spoken about how when you don't have freedom of discourse, freedom to say what you think is true. One of his last broadcasts on Fox News before he got fired was defending the African Socialist Party from a sort of Russiagate type charge. Wow, I think good. some people have understood, some people have come to understand, and I came to understand this in 2016, that if we don't have the ability to exchange ideas and opinions, then our differences don't matter. Like whatever political differences between left and right are irrelevant if you're not able to voice those differences in a way that can actually make a difference, if it's all controlled in this very top-down way. Um, I don't know why it's so difficult for most people to understand that. I think it's because most people, 
and this is going to sound like an extreme hair on fire libtard thing to say but most people have fascistic tendencies most people think that they're right and if they can crush the other side <laughs> that the world will be a better place like i think that drive exists in the average person yeah i mean that's true it's just sad you know um yeah. and then, again i think I mean, I certainly grew up with a different tradition. I never thought like that. Um, yeah, me and, and not not only did I not think like that, I, I remember being taught the exact opposite, like right. over and over and over again, that it was important to 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 fight for people who have loathsome point of views. Like that's right. that's a crucial part of understanding what the the First Amendment is, and they've gone away from teaching that. You know, our, there was a, an important moment, I think, when the ACLU, there was some division after Charlottesville, right? Like, remember there was a there was a, an editorial in the New York Times saying we have to rethink our approach. Right. Um, to, you know, may, maybe we didn't get Skokie right, uh, that kind of thing. And, you know, now, I, yeah, yeah, I think you're right, Keaton. Like, it, it, we, it doesn't matter what our differences are if we can't hash out if we can't even see them <laughs> you know what i'm saying like exactly. if, if they're not if they're not visible um and we're just sitting in siloed areas and not even uh, aware of the uh, opposite arguments i mean that's one of the that's been another eye-opening thing for me is i still to this day talk to people who are in the business who don't know like 99 percent of the stuff that i that i worked on in the last year and have assumptions that they, you know, they got because they watch one or two channels, and that's it. And so, even kicking and screaming and throwing a fit as much as we did in the last year, it doesn't really do much um, in the end because they can so effectively silo people now. And if both sides are going to do it and, and be cool with it, then there's no hope at all. That that has been one of the biggest disappointments with. Uh the reaction to palestine although there have been some hopeful elements mm -hmm. look I'm, I'm not gonna lie and i'm not gonna ask you to take a position for me personally douglas murray was a big disappointment i he is definitely somebody who i've talked about his book on the show and i've said i don't agree with everything in it but the core idea that holding up western civilization for special derision as if its sins are unique to itself and no other cultures have ever done things like this is is foolish it's a false premise it's a complete misunderstanding of history and he was so masterful in that monk debate you know yeah. it was such a great champion of speech and to see the way that he has reacted since uh this war is broken out uh, it just absolutely and it it makes you feel foolish because you're sitting there and you're arguing with people who are saying well this is the fox and the scorpion right you, you can't really ally with these people because the in the end is, you get to the other side they're going to sting you right right and yeah i'm a little i mean i think douglas i would have thought he would come down more on being a champion of the enlightenment right uh, that's that's been kind of his brand, right? right. Uh, um, throughout, and obviously, you know, I, I only got to know him a little bit and during during throughout through that debate. We have some different views and some you know specific issues, but I think the the basic premise was that you know Western civilization has been, has done some tremendous things, um, has accomplished some amazing things because of the enormous energy that uh, all these enlightenment ideas generate and we have to protect them at all costs and not go backwards at the very least not go backwards right for all the other sins of western civilization let's not take go back and ruin the things that actually work um, exactly you can you can argue about all sorts of things that uh, you know america the uk all the five eyes nations um, you know, the imperialistic behavior, the militaristic behavior since World War II, th there's a lot of stuff to criticize. Man. And, and, you know, I've done a lot of that over the years. But the there, there are also incredible things. I mean, America has been home to um, unbelievable innovation. 
uh, art, comedy, all these all these things that wouldn't have been possible if we had not um, had some kind of serious effort to try to protect these values. You know, I, I talked to a pretty high profile lawyer um, a couple of weeks ago, somebody, and who talked about how after World War II, America at least aspir aspirationally did start to actually become like a rule of law society in, in a way that um, was kind of unique in history, right? Like uh, the important moments in our history happened in courtrooms and what happened in those courtrooms mattered. But, right. You know, do we want to go back to when that isn't true anymore? Um, and that's what people seem to be arguing for. Like, you know, they're basically saying democracy doesn't work. Uh, we have to just use force to shut things down. Um, and that's really sad, you know, and, and it's sad to see people you, you would have thought, uh, you know, take the other position, go there. Well, Russell, why don't we get into these hearings? Because you had a question to set us up on that, right? <laughs> yes, I did. Uh, just one other thing on that. Um, you know, with Zionism specifically, it's it's very ironic because it's very much they immediately saw what the problem was with speech is violence, right? They immediately saw what the problem is with that formulation, what an attack it is on the on the core premises of the First Amendment. That's a way of trying to have your cake and eat it too, right? You say you believe in freedom of speech, but speech you don't like is violence, so it's not protected by the First Amendment, right? Because violence isn't protected by it. It's a very dishonest formulation they're doing with zionism they're getting around their supposed free speech bona fides by claiming that it's anti-semitism or more that it's eliminationist right they they have to take it to eliminationist because even anti-semitism under their own premises would kind of be protected so they have to take it to eliminationist right they have to take it which is another way of saying language is violence isn't it i mean it's it's well this is the whole it's an existential threat Right, right. Like everything right, right. Is an existential threat, um, and I mean, interestingly, like in the last year, I've had, you know, if you go back and you look at a lot of the underlying premises of like the war on terror, uh, you know, I've I've had to study um, people like Carl Schmidt, who was a uh, you know a Nazi jurist from the '30s, who was very influential on a lot of the neocons who were um, sort of building Dick Cheney's. Uh, the war on terror machinery, they very much believed in this idea that um, in, an, in an emergency situation, liberal democracy is basically bullshit uh, and that power belongs to the executive who, who seizes it um, and that this is done because a, a core premise of the belief system is that we have, there are friends and enemies, and our enemies mean to destroy us by violence. And this is this is a central part of the idea, is that it, justifying the use of absolute force. Um, we have to because if we don't, they will destroy. They will eliminate us. They will destroy us. And so what you're seeing with the with the Zionist argument is is basically a, a, it's actually a more um, direct. Uh, uh, version of what we got after 9-11. Um, you know, the, the, all, all of those homilies, you know, they hate us for our freedom. Yeah. Right. Blah, blah, right. blah. It, it was never really believable in any way that, that Al-Qaeda was actually going to wipe the United States off the face of the earth, even though they tried, you know. God damn it with their 7-11s! <laughs> 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 I mean, my, my favorite was always the uh, Bush... Was it Bush who talked about them using spraying poison from drones over New York City and not explaining where the drones were going to be taking off from? That was my favorite one. <laughs> um, but the, but it was always the, the, the idea that anybody was going to actually wipe out the United States was ludicrous. So they never really made that argument. Right. Um, they just sort of said that, you know, this is a clash of civilizations. They hate us. They will never stop. It's like a Terminator. Israel is openly saying, like, you must back what we're doing because they mean to remove us from the face of the earth. And you know, there's at least a, a patina of believability in that rhetoric, and that's why they're getting away with saying it. 
Um, but it, it, you have to understand that, I mean, I, I think that this is just a, a version of the same argument we've been getting for 20 years. That we have to fight them here so that they don't come for you. Right, right, exactly. And we, we have to exercise force because we, 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 we must presume that our enemies mean to eliminate us. And, uh, and that's the excuse for, you know, what it, that, that, then you're right back in Dostoevsky land. Like everything is permitted once you get there mentally. Um, uh, you know, that, that not only do, uh, will harm befall us, but, but that will, you know, we will no we will cease to exist if we allow these, this other side to, to speak, act, you know, have political agency, any of those things. Um, and that's how they get away with making these arguments. And it's, it's been baffling, I guess not baffling, but it's just been disappointing to see how effective it's been. Well, but surprisingly, and here's the hopeful thing, um, you very kindly shared my article about this. Mm -hmm. The woke students, the last people you would have expected to be the cavalry for speech, <laughs> all of a sudden took the side of the Palestinians. They actually, remarkably, took seriously what they've been told for at least the last 10 years by all these academics that it's not right to back a colonial project that is aimed at the genocidal destruction of a group of marginalized brown people. But that's a real problem for these universities that get a lot of money from the Defense Department. Well, right. Yeah. No. It, it, and yeah, and and it is at least hopeful, right, that they're sticking to their principles enough that they're going to and they're, they're going to end up protesting the restrictions that have been placed on them to speak out. Right. And the, the, the formulations that have been made, like in this very slapdash way, almost overnight, uh, oh, well, this is this is, uh, you know, it, it's terrorism. It's celebrating terrorist violence. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's hard. It, it's, watching conservatives invoke harm um, has been comical. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they, they've done it. Um, but I, I just wonder how lasting a commitment to those those values you're going to get from that crowd. I mean, you're absolutely right, Russell, and you're, you're correct to point it out. Uh, but I don't know. What, what do you think? I mean, do you, do you think that um they're, they're going to see things the same way with other issues that's that's what i worry about the question is really whether this is a red pill moment for them whether they realize from the pushback they're getting as so many of us i know for me personally the bernie sanders was such a red pill moment for me because of the pushback the campaign got that was what made me realize that everything the institutions I had trusted uh, uh, believed was total bullshit. Everything exactly. they told me they right. It wasn't was just that they had it in for Bernie. It's that everything they said was full of shit, as indicated by their response to the threat of a Democratic Socialist winning the nomination. Right. Right. So now that they see that everything they've been told by these institutions that supposedly cared so much about marginalized identities and colonization as long as you're talking about people who have been dead for 150 years they cared a lot right but, yeah exactly if it, if it interferes with any carlisle group contracts or you know the lockheed martin or anybody else who's funding the new science center uh, right. you know and, and that's the thing a lot of these these kids are 19 years old they have no idea how shit works it, right. it, it takes a while to learn how all the money flows work and um, and why it is that you're a professor who's saying one thing today will say something else tomorrow because, you know, the, the, you know, the grant's going to be on the line now. Um, they're going to learn all this stuff in high speed. And hopefully that will, that will teach them that, you know, behind all the rhetoric they've been getting for a while are these institutions and these institutions are what matter. And this is, you know, this has been a frustration of mine just with reporting in general in America. Like they, they always try to distract people with personalities and, you know, hot takes on politics. Whereas the thing that you, you always got to focus on is w which institutions are behind what, 
because they're the ones that are lasting. They have the, the lasting impact on the situation. And that's what's been so scary about this story is that, they, you know, in, in addition to all the war on terror stuff that we saw before, like the you know, extraordinary rendition, like the um, secret prison complexes, this new project, you know, is global in scope. It involves all the same groups, um, the same military and intelligence partnerships, and now they want to, you know, have absolute dominion over what kinds of topics and narratives are, are, are going to be seen by the entire world. I mean, that's, that's a really radical, uh, terrifying thing to countenance. And it, I guess it just, it, it, it's a, I, I, you have to realize that it's a bridge. It's a long bridge to cross for some people. It takes, it takes a while for them to get there, but this is probably an introductory moment for some of those folks. You're right. Yeah, and the truth of it is kind of hidden in plain sight. I mean, I, I always recognized it. I mean, I never, I didn't spend much time in college, um, but I could see going in that academia is not a bludgeon to be wielded against the establishment. Academia is a gateway into the establishment, especially these Ivy League universities. Look at the list of famous alumni from Harvard, Yale, Brown, Columbia, uh, for every quote unquote revolutionary that's emerged out of there, you can find at least a hundred counter revolutionaries <laughs> who you can identify by name. Like it's the most obvious thing in the world when you think about it for two seconds. Again, that's not the easiest thing, I guess, for an 18 year old to realize, you know, when they fill out the forms. Uh, my favorite moment for that was the 2004 presidential election when we, you had two Skull and Bones members running. Two Skull and Bones, yeah. exactly, right. <laughs> yeah. Come on, exactly. Now. Right. Like, um, yeah, no, I, I, a lot of young people um, who go to these, you know, very, very expensive schools uh, that are clearly designed, that their whole purpose is to mold young, smart kids to become uh, parts of, you know, the elite machinery. And, you know, there, there's, there's a logic to that. That's what, that's what societies do, right? They try to take their best and brightest and, and, and turn them into people who can man, you know, the appropriate positions. But what are those institutions that they're going to? I mean, you have to be kind of blind to not see, if you're a Yale student, that they're looking for people to go work on Wall Street, uh, to, you know, to work in you know, in the defense sector, if you're uh, a science, a science student, um, and then, or, or intelligence, like, they, you know, they're, they're getting their, all their people from your campus. I mean, they recruit, they have recruiting tables. Uh, if you don't see that, you know, by the time you're at least a junior at one of those schools, uh, you're, you're, you're making an effort not to pay attention, I think. I think you're exactly right. Because at that, at that point, you realize hey, this is about making a lot of money. And at that point, you also realize I'm in line to make a lot of money <laughs> if I just right. play along. Right, exactly. Right, right. And look, that's legitimate. Young, young people, especially now, it's tough, right? Like you, you're either looking at a lifetime of having six roommates and never even sniffing owning a house, or, you know, you can go to door number two and, and have a job that, hey, maybe, maybe it's not so morally abhorrent that I won't be able to sleep, you know, every single night, you know, the, the, you, you will start to make those calculations, especially when, when the economy is as bad as it is. And I, I understand that, but you know, don't, don't lie to yourself and, um, about what it is. And that's, what's been frustrating, you know, exactly. is, is seeing all this self-righteousness right. uh, about things when, come on, you know, um, Right. You're there to make a buck. That's what everybody goes to college for. Okay. Right. right. <laughs> but I, I, I think in some respects, not to play the role of the hopeful person here, but I'm gonna, in some respects, you've recreated the conditions that caused the uprisings of the sixties and seventies, because that was also yes, very no, much yeah. a response to elite students realizing that the values of the machine that they were being trained to join did not match the values they were told America had. They start. They were not raised 
to think, well, no, it's okay to give uh, separate but equal accommodations. They were raised to believe America was this place that believed in equality. And then they started looking at what America actually was and they got red pilled. It was just the, the bridge between the values they had been taught to embrace and the realities of the society they lived in were just too great for them to swallow it. And it seems like you've kind of recreated that here because you've drilled into them. Colonialism is the worst thing in the world to, to, to go after marginalized non-white people is the worst thing in the world. Hey, you need to get behind Israel while it bombs the hell out of these Palestinians. It just doesn't square. It just doesn't square. And it's, it's causing, I think, look, we'll see how it plays out. You're right. I mean, could they wind up just deciding to keep their heads down? Sure. But you know what? There is more to people than just looking for those jobs. There, there are core values. And if you've inculcated people with these values for years and years and years, I mean, it's just wall to wall. They've been surrounded by it in the culture, right? You, You know, white privilege and elevating marginalized groups and it's just too much cognitive dissonance to tell them now they have to get behind israel as it commits war crimes yeah i mean you're right and and there there certainly was like a parallel thing that happened in the early 60s you know the free speech movement in in berkeley there were an awful lot of kids who were realizing hey uh, you know i'm going to end up building weapons that are going to be deployed against or or Vietnamese kids, um, you know, I don't want to do that, right? So he, I, I think the the gigantic difference, though, is that there, the 60s in America were a time of enormous plenty, right? Um, mm-hmm. And there was a, an awful lot of room to just sort of drop out of society and, and you know, make your way, right, somehow. There, there wasn't this, like, desperation um, yeah, we had factories back then. That's true. All right. right? Yeah. And that, that was a very wealthy, you know, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the, the Mrs. Robinson generation, they, they had a lot of options. And it, I, I think that was a big factor in, in, in the decision to rebel in the way that they did. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I think, I mean, I, I hope you're right uh, that this is a wake up call moment uh, for those folks. But, um, maybe it won't be, you know, we'll see. It's a, it's a, it's a fair point. It's that de- it's definitely easier to blow off the man when the man has five jobs on offer for every applicant. Right. right. <laughs> but this one, you're right. I mean, it's, 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 an, it, it, there, there's such cognitive dissonance with the way, um, with, with the story that it's, it's going to be very tough for a lot of these kids to, um, you know, to square all the the contradictory messages they've been getting but um we'll see we'll see Um, oh and also remember in the end most of those kids didn't give up that prosperity most of them didn't go jim ignatowski and drive a cab most of them wound up back inside the system but a system changed enough that they could tolerate it well right and that that's that and that's the uh the christopher lash uh the you know his books were um you know all about that the sort of you know way people like jerry rubin kind of effortlessly right uh, morphed from being sort of leftist radicals to being uh you know sort of young entrepreneurial capitalists and then uh, you know they went straight from the being the yippies to to starting up companies like apple and yeah i mean that, uh, that that's what that generation was all about um this this one I think is different though. I think they're they're a little bit harder core in their politics. Um, th- at least their starting place was, you know. Uh, so I, I had, I'll have a harder time seeing them just sort of, you know, uh, tr- just move into in Silicon Valley and you know start up Death dot com or whatever the next iteration <laughs> of this whole system is, you know. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, uh- all right, my erstwhile partner is going to stab me if I don't get into the congressional hearings. <laughs> so let's do the hearings. All right, so uh, that was the warm-up act, folks. Yeah. All right, so so in one of your articles, you thanked uh, Jim Jordan 
for investigating the IRS, visiting your house, and he did a broad investigation that's actually led to a reform that they're not going to do that anymore. And uh, you, you closed out the article saying, I gave votes to the editorial note, Democratic Party for 30 years. Which elected Democrat would have performed basic constituent services in my case? Feel free to raise a hand. If silence is the answer, why should I ever vote for a Democrat again? And in another article, you quoted your podcast co-host Walter Kern regarding Democrats saying, stopping them electorally is probably the only way forward. Uh, so what are you trying to tell us, Matt? Are you post duopoly or do you have an announcement to make on the show about your no, I don't, no. I mean, I, you I don't just, have any bright red Adidas hats that you can wear? To these <laughs> I, do, I, I, I have a full red Adidas hat. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's, a, it's a tough pill to swallow, but they got uh, I think even that hearing this week, though, was kind of an epiphany for me um, because Schellenberger and I going into the hearing, we had strategized, what are we trying to accomplish with this? And, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do uh, is, you know, reach out to people who were erstwhile Democratic voters and try to convince them that this, this issue should matter to them and why it should matter to them. And so, I, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to formulate arguments about why this is really a class thing. Um, not only is it going to affect issues like, you know, Palestinian activism or healthcare for all or whatever, you know, take your pick. There were a lot, lots of other things that we, we found in both the Twitter files and the CTI files that were aimed at the left as well. Uh, but, you know, in, in the course of the last year or so, um, it's become abundantly clear to me that the Democratic Party is just fundamentally intertwined with this project, that this right. is their project. Um, the Republicans are really, they're really outsiders in this thing um, in ways that uh, they weren't in, during the war on terror years. Uh, you know, if, if Dick Cheney was the leading uh, proponent of programs like Extraordinary Rendition, uh, torture, you know, enhanced interrogation, all that stuff. The mainstream Republican Party basically needs to, you know, get an, in, an invitation to even sit at the table at the discussions for things like um, the Global Engagement Center, uh, you know, the, the CISA, the programs that they're trying to institute. There are no Republicans involved in any of these projects, not that I've been able to see. And right. you Right. see at this hearing that there are no Democrats standing up and arguing this issue um, or, or even trying to tell you why they think it matters because this, it's, a, this is them, right? Like when, when, you're, right. when you're talking about this, this issue, you're talking about something that's just fundamental to their entire uh, brand of politics now. So, they, you know, they're, they're going to have to be beaten at the, at the polls. I don't know if it would be very tough for me to imagine voting for Donald Trump, but I've, I've already decided that it, at the very least, I'm going to be voting for somebody like West or, or Kennedy. I mean, it's going to have to be something like that. Um, but, but they can't win. You know, they got, they got to suffer a loss over this, this stuff because this, this, this stuff is incredibly dangerous and it's not just about speech. It's about politics. That's the thing that's so, scary about it um and if the if the next step happens and you have like an americans style version of the digital services act you know then it, then this is 1984 territory from there you know so i don't know what do you guys think i mean i'm i i i, I don't know i don't know what well, well, actually, can you can you can you explain for our viewers what the digital services act is so this is the eu's big uh speech regulation it's a it's a regulation of the internet um uh, that was passed last year it's a gigantic regulatory um framework and it has basically a um a system wherein private platforms like x twitter or facebook or google uh have to partner up with these uh 
people who are called trusted flaggers. And these are credentialed uh, sort of news readers designated by the European Union. Uh, and they are, you know, they're a number in the thousands. And basically, if the companies do not abide by the recommendations of the EU's trusted flaggers, if they allow too much of X kind of speech or Y kind of speech or whatever, then they suffer basically crippling financial penalties. You're going to see this play out with it, with Twitter soon because right. Elon right. so far has, has refused to do it. Essentially, this is just censorship, right? It, it, it's, it's basically saying um, if, you, if you don't go along with these recommendations, you're going to pay uh, fines that will put you out of business. That's the model. And it's already, because these companies are global, um, it, it already has a huge impact on what you can see even about something like Gaza, right? Um, or the other side of, uh, you know, Ukraine war. I mean, where, where do you go to look to find out what's actually happening in Ukraine? There's nowhere to look, right? And that's not an accident. So they've been, you know, there, there are a couple of laws. There's, there's the Restrict Act was the, like, the first uh, attempt to really draw up what that legislation would look like in America, but they don't really even need it. All they would need is just more things like that in other parts of the world. And these companies will, will just do that work on their own. But I do think they're eventually going to try to pass something like that here. Yeah, I mean, you asked, like, you know, what do we think the solution is? And I, I think the, the answer lies in examining kind of how the Republicans became outsiders in this whole process, in this whole regulation of speech process and project and i think they were forced into it by the base i mean they wanted to box trump out of that primary in 2016 but there was a populist revolt within the party and the base of the party literally dragged them into not necessarily as we articulated earlier this like uh, very principled civil liberty stand, but they 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 got sort of Steve Bannonized into it, right? The dismantling of the administrative state, as he would call it, right? Just a you know suspicion of concentrated power, um, a rejection of top down control over the day to day lives of ordinary people, and with that came sort of an implicit rejection of a lot of the Bush era posturing of the GOP. Uh, the problem, of course, as you mentioned, is that the Democrats made and continue to make such a populist revolt within their party impossible. Uh, they have put in place structural barriers that literally wall that off. They just canceled the Florida Democratic primary. Canceled it. No vote. <laughs> <laughs> right? They put Biden on the ballot. They wouldn't put anybody else on the ballot. That's it. So that makes the Democratic Party a closed door. That's what Russell and I have been saying for now, you know, the past few years. Um... West, sure, if he could get on a ballot, that'd be nice. He voluntarily took himself off of 17 state ballots when he switched from green to independent. RFK, I mean, I couldn't go into a voting booth and pull the lever for RFK, given the things that he's said and signaled oh, he'll yeah. do as re I, regards I to this conflict. Hillary Clinton, so, I mean, what's that? I voted for Hillary Clinton, so my my my, my tolerance for vote, voting for but I'm sorry, I, I'm no, no, I, I got you. I'm, I got saying, you. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like. In terms of fair who, enough. <laughs> in terms of like, okay, who are we gonna vote for? Who are we gonna vote for? I, I've I've punted. Like, I'm not gonna rack my brains and worry about it now. I'm not excited about anybody. This is a hopeless election. That's why the Free Palestine protests are inspiring to me because I see some activism. I see real pressure being exerted on the system, and out of that must come something because that's really the only hope I see right now. Yeah, um, you know, I, I I I was hoping that. You know, there maybe there will be a meeting of the minds, right? Where uh, the you know sort of the the, the free Palestine activists will uh, you know sort of make some kind of a bridge with other populist movements and uh, and realize that ultimately, you know, at, at the heart of this thing is there's militarism and authoritarianism. That's the that's the common theme. Um, I think they, you know, the, a, a lot of different factions are going to end up realizing that they have a common um, uh, enemy, right? And I think enemy is the wrong word, but... Uh, no, I think that makes sense. 
Yeah. No, sure. I think it's fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the right word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the frustration for me, though, is just, okay, if I, the, Gaza, Palestine, I, I understand that that's an animating issue for a lot of people, but this thing that's been, that, that's happening in the United States, the sort of building of this uh, intelligence surveillance state it is, a, is a long developing story that goes back like, you know, 20 years now. You know, even, even things like, you know, the sort of the subtle rollbacks of the church committee um, uh, reforms, right? So the, after the 70s, the FBI used to have to have a reason to open a file on you. They used to have to have a reason to investigate you, to surveil you. They stopped doing that, right? And, right. and the, the, those FBI whistleblowers who came out last year, you know, I interviewed some of those guys, and they would talk about how... You know, like there are FBI offices that where half the agents are not doing work that goes to a case, and they just sit there gathering information. Um, or as one guy told put it to me, they'll they'll just post up outside houses, right? They'll just sit there in vans watching people. That, I mean, that is massively fucked up. I mean, I like Gaza aside. You have to realize that they're building something here in the U.S. right now right, right. that that is terrifying is going to last beyond whatever happens over there in Israel. Um, and I think a lot of people just don't know about it because this, this issue has been so successfully kept under wraps. Um, I'm not making a very good case for, for, for this, but it's it's just been very frustrating to watch because the, the, they've successfully coded all this as a as a right only thing and sure. all the people who se seem to care about this in the bush years are suddenly gone and and yes. use them, you know um uh, and that that's what's that's what's frustrating well yeah that's i think is the most frustrating part about it um anyway i got some video to play but russell do you want to uh did you want to say something first uh well they they've they've played on the class snobbery of what was the old Rockefeller Republican base in order to get them to basically swallow anything as long as it's framed as an attack on those people. Right. 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 Those people. Well, I saw somebody share a meme today and I've seen the, I've seen this before, but it's somebody I know is like a wealthy, successful Hollywood type. This guy with you know showing a yacht convinced this guy and it shows a guy in the plaid shirt that this guy is the cause of his problems and it shows migrants picking uh you know fruit well how about liberals convince themselves that they didn't abuse this guy to such an extreme that now they want to blow up the entire system <laughs> you know, right. like that. they will they will never examine it that way and it seems and i'm going to get into this because lately in both your congressional testimony and in um in your article about uh, man i always want to say c-l-i-t where they see <laughs> <laughs> never thought about that well, you have, you should have figured out a name, a way to name it CLIT. It would have gotten a lot of eyeballs. You know, you're frustrated. This isn't getting enough attention. Maybe you should try coming up with some catchier, uh, <laughs> some catchier acronyms. Penetrating the mystery of the CLIT. Yeah, right. yeah, there you go. <laughs> that would get some Substackers pouring in. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, but you've been focusing in on that class dimension, which which we'll be getting into, which I, which I agree with. But, Keaton, you want to go to some video? Yeah, I feel like we have to show this video uh, of uh, Matt, your friend Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, asking you one of the most ludicrous questions I've ever heard asked anyone uh, in any hearing uh, at all um, about uh, what an absolutist you are and where you draw the line in terms of what should be allowed uh, on the internet. All of us here today have heard the stories of the depths of human depravity from the Hamas attack, resulting in unthinkable brutality, including the mass murder of innocent Jews and civilians on October 7th. Witnessing such barbarity steals part of your humanity, and it demonstrates how hatred can drive humans to do unspeakable things to one another. And nowhere is hatred more evident than on social media. 
Since the October 7th attack, anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim hate speech has exploded online. In just one month after the attack, the hashtag Hitler was right appeared in over 46,000 posts. But the rhetoric isn't limited to hate speech and death threats. Jewish conspiracy theories and disinformation continually find safe harbor on social media platforms. Even the racist and anti-Semitic great replacement theory was recently amplified on Twitter slash X by none other than its owner, Elon Musk, and the right-wing darling, Tucker Carlson. Terrorists <laughs> used the platforms to terrorize target populations, and Hamas even used the personal accounts of hostages and victims to live stream their brutality to incite further violence. Mr. Taibbi, yes or no, should social media companies allow rape and murder to be live streamed by terrorists on their platforms in order to create fear and incite violence? <laughs> I believe that would violate their terms of service. So, so your answer is no, it, it should not do, they, they should not be allowed to do that. Live stream rape and murder? No, right. I, think that, I think that would count as... Good answer. <laughs> nice one. I'm playing that again. So, so your answer is no, it, it should not do, they, they should not be allowed to do that. Live stream rape and murder? No, right. I, think that, I think that would count as... Now look, speech, I know they sent the IRS to your house and I know, you know, you're under oath so you got to be careful about sarcasm and, and but... Um, how tempting was it to just be like, yes, I think they should be allowed. <laughs> In fact, that's why Elon and I had a falling out, because I called him a hypocrite. I said, you know, you should really be allowing people to live stream their murders on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I probably should have. You know, the, the, the problem is that the, the Congress is, the, is designed to make you like paranoid and uh, intimidated. And so your instinct for humor, actually, I admire Schellenberger for this because he, he, he's able to do this. But I, I, I get so focused on, like, not saying the wrong thing. But, yeah, yeah I should have said something like that. I should have, I should have been like, yeah, no, I'm all for that. They should have. <laughs> right. they, should, they should bring back as many snuff films as possible. <laughs> um, but, I mean, come on. What a ridiculous tactic. Like, uh, you know, art. Are, are you are you favor uh, are, are you in favor of you know the, the Sinaloa cartel chainsawing heads off on, on right? I mean, well, she she refers to something that clearly does not fall under free speech. You know, live stream right. rape and right. murder is not a speech issue at all. And then she tries to use that to checkmate you here. There's there's a a, a bit more yeah. live stream rape and murder. No, right. I think that I think that would count as speech that would be prohibited under their term. Good, service. good. You do have absolutist policies, um, but... I do least, not have absolute... Least, I, do, I do not have... Please don't interrupt me. You have absolute... I've asked your question. You answered it. You do have absolutist policies. At least they have some limits, but I think a Homeland Security official... Um, with respect, if, if, if Congresswoman, a, if, all journalists me, operate under my time. limits. If a Homeland Security official echoed your opinion, you would call it censorship, but I'm glad that at least you acknowledge no. that rape and murder <laughs> should not be no. allowed on... No, if a Homeland Security official said you're not allowed to live stream murder, Matt Taibbi here, now you're with us. You can settle this. Would you consider that censorship? No, of course not. <laughs> okay, there you go. Let's clip this and maybe we can be played in the halls of Congress next time they call you in. But, but, but you see, uh, the, the, the tactic is so absurd. They, they don't they don't want to ask you a difficult question. Should... should, should, should um, Hamas rhetoric be allowed on, right. on online, right? Then we start to get into issues. Uh, you know, it, it, there, it, this is like a stupid trial lawyer tactic. Uh, Goldman was actually funnier with this um, because he, he did it backwards. You know, the, they, they usually do like, um, you know, what color is the sky today, Mr. Taibbi? And right. Blue, right? Well, I'm glad you agree with me that the sky is blue. But he, but he, you know, did the he, he uh, messed it up and went to the punchline. <laughs> yeah, he went to the punchline <laughs> to the setup. But she was she's doing the same thing. Is she an attorney? I, for, I forget. Wasserman. Is, is she an attorney? I don't is know. Wa is Wasserman Schmuck an attorney? That a little bit, um, but you know, it, it's that kind of questioning. Like you, you will agree with me that this ridiculous thing I just said is is true. Um, yeah, and the, but but that was particularly irritating because I've answered that question like five million times over the last few years, and you know, a, one Google search would find me saying I am not a free speech absolutist. No, nope, nobody is. 
Um, right. Explain that because one of the one of the Republicans, not surprisingly, gave you a chance to to fill that out. So what? So what do you mean? Because you made the you you real you really explained that journalists actually favor limitations, but not these limitations. Limitations that are legal and clear. Right. So uh, you know we, we're all tra- we're all trained. What's libel? Uh, what's defamation? What are the particularly dangerous forms of libel, right? Like libel per se, like that's the kind of thing where, uh, you know, somebody who sues you is going to have an automatically strong argument that you massively disrupted their ability to make money, to have a family. And so that's things like accusing somebody of sexual deviance, of, um, you know, pedophilia, uh, a very serious crime, right? That'll, that'll, especially a financial crime that, that that's going to ma- impact your business. So you learn all of these things. Um, and H- hence what, allegedly, right. Hence allegedly, but that, but more importantly, like you have to lock it down before you, before you publish it. Um, and it's important to have those rules because uh, that not only does that keep us honest, but it also lets us know that when we're right, right, if we got the evidence and everything, that the law is going to protect us. All right. So those those prohibitions, those restrictions, like you know, cases like New York New York Times v. Sullivan, those are very important for investigative journalists because they tell us exactly where the lines are um, and how far you can go um, and how much you can say with X amount of evidence, right? Uh, and without that, it would be terrifying. Like if there were, if there were no rules at all and people could just sue you, like they, this is a little bit the case in England, right? Where, right, you, right. where you, right. you can be right, hundred percent right and still get creamed in court. Um, that's or cancel I, you. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Or cancel you. Right. And, and so, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm rambling on, but no, no, no. The, all those rules are, are we're always we've always been in favor of those rules because they they clarify the situation for us and if, if we screw you know if, if there's a mistake it's adjudicated you go before a court you have a chance at least to ar- argue um, you know argue that that you got it right uh, so it's this new system has no rules you don't know where the line is they can do anything to you at any time and that's what's so scary like there, there's nothing to protect journalists so anyway that's just frustrating um, oh, no, that's what i was gonna say like that's the whole point when so like when they talk about terms of service as dan goldman will talk about in the next clip that we have and you talked about um in that clip that we just saw you know i i'm not against terms of service uh when it comes to a platform like youtube where we are now like to have terms of service is fine. They just have to be clear and they have to be enforced fairly um, with a human perspective. You can't just send an AI robot out there to enforce the terms of service. So like obviously uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz used a, just a ridiculously extreme example of live streaming a horrific violent crime. Right. But for example, like there are certain pieces of video out of Gaza that we can't show on YouTube because it's too graphic, it's too violent. And we kind of know that because their rules about violent content are fairly clear. And so we just don't break them. But then they have other rules like the one that uh, Matt Orfala, I guess, broke when he made that video that I think you, it was either for your uh, outlet or you shared it about the 2016 election denialism on the Democrats part. And he was making this point about how, you know, they're all over Donald Trump for denying the 2020 results. But here's this montage of Democrats basically insinuating that Russia stole the 2016 election. He wasn't making any claims at all about any election being invalid. He was simply making a point about how hypocritical the Democrats were. Of course, an AI robot sniffing around doesn't know that. And so they gave him a strike for that and they took that down. And that that's an example of the rules being really murky and not enforced with any consistency, any accountability. That's what makes it dangerous. So it's not that you want a Wild West situation where everyone can say everything up to including, you know, threats, slurs, things like that. No, have terms of service, but make them clear like you were just talking about. It's important to have boundaries so that you know where they are and what they are. Right. And 
you can even in YouTube, they, they, they can they can ding you for something that you haven't even published yet. It can, yep. it can be in the queue, yep. ready to go, yep. uh, and the, the robot will detect it, and you, exactly. know, you can get a strike for that. And this just gets back to the whole question of like, do, do you want a, like a rule of law society where, where you know, there's, there's a set of clear rules, you get to argue it and, you know, before some kind of process. I mean, this is, again, this is sort of basic America, Fifth Amendment stuff. Um, you know, the terms of service, you would like it to approximate that, right? Where you would have some kind of process. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. Yes. Right. And it, they don't, right? And and the, the problem with that is that I think there's a... There's this tendency now to just say it's okay for things to be done behind closed doors by by you know the quote unquote responsible people, and leave it at that and and you know trust us, and you can't. That's the whole point, right? Like our right. Our, our whole society is built on the on the whole on the notion that you cannot trust uh, people to exercise power. Uh, in a responsible way, that you need to have checks and, and balances on it constantly because people will s screw other people. And you're, you're seeing this drift towards um, this, you know, non-rules-based society, uh, which is very frustrating. Well, Matt, let, <clears throat> let me ask you what you think about this, because you've, you've written so much about the decline of the news business. And and you've made it clear, you're not saying that it was perfect in the past, but it, that it's definitely lost that core of, uh, of principle of objectivity. And you even make the case that objective journalism was a business model, that it wasn't even necessarily noble. You don't even hold it up in that way. Um, but, you know, with the death of Kissinger this week, we we did it. We did a little piece on it through the lens of some of Hitchens' last words about Kissinger, and I said, you know, and we're we're almost exactly the same age. So you probably remember this from when you were a child. I remember when Kissinger was a pop star. Like I I had there was a giant size Muhammad Ali versus Superman boxing comic book, and they had in the front row were all these celebrities of that era, and Kissinger uh -huh. was in that. <laughs> you know, like that, that even for a children's comic book, they threw Kissinger in. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So what was the news media always essentially this bad in a, in a certain sense? I mean, they definitely pumped up Kissinger as a rock star, you know, Joe Namath and Jacqueline Onassis. And he was in that pantheon of just really hip, cool, chic figures that you were supposed to love. And he was he was a monster. Well, that's that's true, and but he was a product of that era that you know we 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 started to see this after World War II when there was this movement toward and Thomas Frank writes about this in his book uh, The People Know that we got away from the idea of uh, popular rule, um, pop, you know, programs done for for the general population, and instead. Let's just put the machinery of government in the hands of the best and the brightest, right? This like enlightened managerial class that became the new ideal. And Kissinger, for a lot of people, uh, symbolized that system. He was the the brilliant academic who, you know, could keep it all in his head. And for a lot of of a certain kind of journalist, um, for for those folks. You know, they adored everything about him, his accents, uh, right. you know, his his witticisms. He did have he did say some funny things. I mean, didn't he wasn't he the one who said um, the politics and academia are so vicious because the stakes are so low? Uh, like he, he, he was capable of some very good one liners. And as you know, journalists can be have their pants uh, charmed off rather quickly by anybody with, you know, an intellect over, you know, like a B plus. Uh, and he was a smart guy, and they they loved him. But my counter to you would be that Cy Hirsch was also a rock star, and his whole you know raison d'être was to expose Henry Kissinger as a monster. Um, you know, he wrote that book, The Price of Power, that was a number one bestseller, and talked about how Kissinger, um, you know, had the Secret Services monitoring all the 
the uh, phone traffic in Washington and giving him daily updates or weekly updates on anything anybody said about him because he was such a narcissist. Um, so yes, the press was always terrible. Uh, they were always sycophantic. I think there were, there was a model for the, the mass media sycophant that became kind of institutionalized, especially in the Kennedy years uh, forward. But we did always have this other thriving thing in um, in journalism that was kind of oppositional, and that's what's disappeared. In the, in the same way that the kind of you know Paul Wellstone, Russ Feingold type of uh, liberal has disappeared from the caucus and the Democratic Party, they're just not there anymore, right? So that's a, that would be my answer. I don't know. Do, do you, what's what's your take on that? Um, I, I think you're right, but I also think, okay, so they killed this Cy Hirsch monster, right? By basically pulling all the Cy Hirsches out of the mainstream media, right? And marginalizing all of those kinds of voices. This is really the battle that I think you're stuck in the middle of for good or for ill. Um, the internet has reinvigorated those voices and arguably made them more powerful and more pervasive than ever before. It is terrifying to them that every figure that they speak against, like Joe Rogan, only gets more popular. Right. Um, so they are trying to find a way to develop a legal framework by which to eliminate those voices as they had arguably eliminated them for a while. They got rid of that. I think that's exactly right. Like you could even go back and pinpoint it starts with the Arab Spring, Occupy, Tea Party. They already started the counter movements then, but as soon as Brexit and Trump happened, that's suddenly yes. there's money for the Global Engagement Center. There's the Department of Defense is pouring money into these weird domestic uh, speech monitoring programs. Um, yeah, I think that that's basically the plot is they they had systematically kicked the, the noisome, troublesome investigative journalists out of the system. But the internet is so powerful that you don't even need to be, uh, you know, in a corporate institution anymore. So now they have to just close out every distribution system possible and, and they're doing it, you know, and that, that's why you have to go out kicking and screaming. I mean, and, and raising a fuss and, you know, the, well, and opening up your own shop. I mean, you were, t you were talking about this last time you were on how, you know, the irony is that, um, you know, as much as they like to hand ring and pearl clutch, you know, and even talk down to the independent journalists, like Substacker is like a, dirty word you know, oh he's got a substack but you went to substack greenwald initially went to substack now he's on locals same thing though free speech writing multimedia platform cy hirsch is on substack now and the ultimate irony is this is it like as they've tried to box <clears throat> pardon me you know the sort of scrappy independent journalist out of the business you said last time, and I think you're right, uh, it's actually easier now to make a living as a journalist than it was back then because you can do it on your own and build a following based on the strength of your work. If we have, if, 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 there's a big if, and this is what they're trying to crack down on, if there is actually a free and open internet. Right, and that's, I've already seen a, a huge difference even since the last time that we, you know, have talked. Um, all they have to do is limit the, ability for things to be seen, change the algorithms, um, make it harder for the mass audience to see you. Uh, and, you know, the great thing about Substack is that they, they, they can't do that, right, because it's email. But the problem is the marketing. You still have to market somehow, right? right? And if you can't do it on X or Twitter, um, it, it becomes very, very difficult. So, I mean, that had to be a heartbreaker. Let me just ask you that point blank now that you touched on that. So you do the Twitter files with Elon thinking that this is part of some broader free speech, anti-censorship effort. And then 
he turns around and he throttles Substack links, not just so that you can't get your work out there, but it became it became impossible or not worthwhile for us to write our little blogs that we did because there was no way to share them around. You know, uh, if you don't have to have a small email list and you can't put them up on X, that just kills you. Um, I, I just, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, what was that like when you found out that this guy <laughs> was going to basically shut down, shut that door in your face after everything you did with him and for him? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I, I was, that was, that was a tough week. Cause that was like the day after the Medi thing happened too. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I remember like, saying exactly the, the same thing. I remember saying that when we covered it, I'm like, God damn. Yeah. What a one, two punch. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, um, the money—the money thing is very frustrating because uh, I don't think it's an accident that Barry and I and Schellenberger were the key people involved in the Twitter files because without the ability to take a long break or, or you know, enough of a financial cushion from an existing uh, subscriber base to do a long research project it would have been impossible right your, your average substack person who, who depends on that money for a living has to crank out content at a huge rate uh, right. in order in order to actually put food in the table and you know the, the twitter files people forget the content was going out on you know that everybody was looking at was on twitter right they, they weren't buying it on substack so it was it was great visibility for us uh but the money you know was was really uh, oddly enough i got more of a financial bounce out of the hearings in march uh than from the twitter files but yeah this whole thing with elon has been very frustrating because it, not just me but a lot of his loudest supporters um in were on substack and uh you know yeah, I think he was trying to buy the platform. I think he was he, he was trying to buy Substack, and they wouldn't allow it. And oh, the, wow. the, yeah, and and the, and the guy doesn't understand. He he has uh, his understanding of like what things look like to an actual journalist is 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 strange. Like we we had an argument about it, and he's like, "Well, why wouldn't why wouldn't you just move to to Twitter subs and?" And I said, well, first of all, because we get a lot of shit for it. But second of all, why would I ever put my financial, uh, you know, uh, like existence in the hands of somebody who's already censored me? Right. right. You, like like that, that's like a massive business mistake. I can't, you know, it, it would be suicide. But it's suicide anyway if you if if you can't uh, if you can't market on on Twitter. So, um but you know that's my problem. And that's well, it's not just your problem. It's a it's a huge problem no, it's because it, problem. It, it it it's everyone's problem because and it was it's so antithetical to like his mission statement, quote unquote, when he bought what's now X, right? I mean, like the the, the whole point was for people to be able to share what they say, and then he made this like very proprietary move. Whereas, well, because I don't know now, you just told I didn't I had no idea that that was in the offing that he was trying to buy it but it makes sense because he was pissed off about their substack notes copying his format or he said something about api i don't know that's all greek to me yeah, but the, it was just a real kick in the kick in the head i mean his the the outrage about you know substack trying to steal his business by doing notes this was after he had tried to m get me to move to Twitter subs, so he, he's trying to take Substack's business, um, right? And you know, and, and he and, and he's outraged that they're that they're building uh, their own community there. Um, you know, I, none of it made any sense. It, it was, but most of all, it was frustrating just because, uh, you know, it, it put it put a lid on. I mean, I, I would love to be able to speak out more about the shit that's happening with elon right the, the 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 things that are going on in europe the media matters things um 
But I have now I'm forced every time I write about that or talk about that to point out this guy is not exactly, you know, a supporter of free speech. I mean, it's it's right. very personary with him. Um, yeah. So it's 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 an it's an enormously frustrating thing. But my experience with media, though, is that there's it tends to find a way. Right. Like there, there, there tends to always be some kind of way that people get around, uh, get around whatever the obstacles are. Um, however, we're getting to the point where that's like going to end up being standing on a street corner. That's what I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little bit worried that that's where we're headed, you know? Well, cause that's the what? only real, like, the, like with the, with the advent of the internet came the potential for like a truly democratized and globalized public square. And that's why they have to crack down on it because the elites don't want a democratized public square. They want the public square to be exactly what you just said standing on a street corner where only 50 or 60 people walk by you at a time. And so that's your maximum reach at any given moment, as opposed to what we're doing now. We have 2,500 people watching us right now as we speak, and we're a relatively small channel. You know, you had 2 million followers. I mean, your Twitter account was on fire. I mean, you were one of the most viral accounts there was. You'd tweet something out within seconds. It would have thousands of likes and retweets and shares. That's an amazing platform. But ultimately, the elites don't want it. The Democratic Party doesn't want it. And Elon doesn't really want it either, apparently. I mean, it, it's a brand for him, it seems. Yeah, I mean, I, I I have a lot. I don't know the full story, right? It, it's it, it was a little bit suspicious to me that the Twitter files, I mean, whatever his personal differences were with me, it was pretty conspicuous that they stopped. Um, I mean, he could have continued with other journalists. Uh, you know, he could have continued doing it with Schellenberger. He could have continued doing it with Paul Thacker or, you know, or, or other journalists. And so this sudden, oh, I'm so mad about this that we're going to shut this whole thing down. It had the odor to me of some other kind of um, motivation in the background. Uh, I don't think it was an accident that Linda Yaccarino came on board afterwards and, you know, in an effort to try to maybe reverse some of the advertiser boy boycotts that were going on. I'm sure he was taking all kinds of heat, um, you know, for stuff that was coming out in the Twitter files. I know he wasn't thrilled about some of the directions that the, some of those reports went in. Uh, he, he had a lot of enthusiasm for certain topics that we never really got into. Um, and there were others that, you know, he didn't really ever ask us to get into that we got into. Uh, and, you know, he, he may have, he may have gotten some phone calls. And in fact, I'm, I can almost guarantee that he got uh, some pretty serious phone calls after some of the stuff that we did. And, you know, I mean, I understand that. That's why we all had this meeting early on in the, in, the, in, the, in the Twitter files. And one of the first things we all came to the conclusion uh, was that this is this is temporary. <laughs> Whatever this is, it's not going to go on yeah. for a long time. Yeah. I don't know what the end game is, this is, but it's not going to last forever. So let's just get as much shit as we can and, you know, and you know, keep this rolling as long as we can as, as, uh, through whatever means we can, um, which I think was, you know, looking back, could there, w it would have been nice to keep, to extend it a little bit longer because I think there was, there were, we, there was some other stuff we could have found out, but there's more stuff. I mean, there, there are more leaks. The problem is how many, how many people are going to see those leaks? That's the, that's the issue. Um, right. Do that with Julian Assange, right? I mean, that, this, that was the the beginning of, of the strategy of how to deal with all this. Um, and he he was the first person that they whipped out the you know cutting off banking services with. And you know, it's a little terrifying to see that the where where the end game was with him. But you know, le le leaks are not to be countenanced apparently in this new system. Well, and that's I mean, a lot of this. When Elon first took over Twitter, and we took some shit from some of our audience for this, but then there are, you know, you have all your Elon stands too. But why? You trust Elon Musk? And we always said, no, we wouldn't piss on Elon if he was on fire. But you've got a system that's so corrupt that you're forced to choose between billionaires. You're forced to choose do you prefer Dorsey or do you prefer Elon? And, and really, it's, it's, 
you know, we have an oligarchy. It's like the Venetian Republic where you have democracy among an aristocracy and the great debates are happening between them. So you have the, you have this Musk, uh, Thiel faction that's nominally pro free speech. They're better than the other billionaires, right? And they're, they're having this fight and the peasants here are forced to choose between which aristocrats they want to champion or which they want to support or which they want to align with. And that's what I see with Elon. I, I do not understand working people who run around worshiping a billionaire. I don't care what billionaire it is. I don't, yeah. I don't get it. No, I, 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 look, people made, made a great hay of the fact, oh, you're, you're doing, you're carrying water for a billionaire. Um, right. Uh, information comes from who else is going to have that information? Right. Right. Uh, right. And like yeah. that's your job as a journalist to make that kind of a value judgment about where your information comes from. Yeah. And I, I went through this a lot with the financial services industry, um, you know, especially in the beginning, I had a lot of sources who were very wealthy, like hedge fund types, um, who, you know, their basic complaint was, the, these big banks, you know, go, Goldman and Chase and Bank of America, they've essentially fused with the government and what they're doing isn't capitalism. And that that way they're not fighting fair with, pe with you know, people like us. And, you know, therefore I'm going to tell you like nine things about them that really suck. And, okay, you know, maybe this guy might not be my friend uh, in, in the normal parlance, right? He's... He, he, it might even be a private equity person whose uh, entire reason for living is to eliminate jobs. But in that moment, um, you know, you're getting information about an even more powerful actor. I mean, that's right. those are the calculations you make. It's just, that's just, that's the kind of thing that happens in the moment. You know, Elon has a streak of independence. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't like to be told or dictated to. And, What's interesting about that is that this whole informational thing, it's a cartel and it doesn't work if everybody isn't involved. Right. Um, and so that's why he's under such an intense attack. And again, I, I, I would love to be highlighting that aspect of it, um, but he makes it, he makes it tough. Uh, he sure, you know, he does. Well, so, so why, so while we're on that, um, let me get your take on this because the last couple of weeks, this was uh, this was quite a uh, quite an exercise in uh, Elon's Queen of Hearts management style, as I would call it. Um, so he seems to co-sign a tweet that many people would read as anti-Semitic. He immediately after that goes ahead and bans the phrase "from the river to the sea" from X as eliminationist um media matters drops this story that he's now suing for probably with some justification where they, some i think yeah yes yeah. where they cl they claim that ads were appearing with neo-nazi content something that schellenberger tried to reproduce in the lab and was not able to get the same results so he's suing for that he goes and gives a tongue bath to netanyahu seemingly in order to get back the advertisers that have left under pressure from media matters. Um, and then he immediately comes back and tells all the advertisers to go fuck themselves. <laughs> Which, that moment was great. I love that. You know, uh, so what do you make of this? Because why would you go give Netanyahu a tongue back? Like, why would you degrade yourself that way? <laughs> right. You and then come back and pull that move. And then what give it all was away. That? Right. Give it all why? back. Yeah. You know, there is, if you read the Isaacson biography, um, he suggests in a couple of places that Elon has multiple personality disorder. And it's funny, not until I read that, that I think, yeah, you know what? Maybe, right? Because like I had, I didn't see him a whole lot, but I definitely had exchanges with him where it's like, his whole affect just changed completely. Like in the last 30 minutes, we just had a discussion where he didn't remember the contents of a conversation we had 90 minutes ago. Um, he's, he's, he's a, he's an impossible read. He would be very difficult to play poker with. 
uh, in our initial meeting about the Twitter files, I was really nervous because, uh, you know, you're always trying to read what's the motive, right? Why does the person want to do this? Now, I got a very strong sense that he was doing this because he was fucking pissed about something and wanted to just shove this up somebody's ass. And I got the feeling that it was the right people. So um, right. then I, I felt that that was satisfying enough to, uh, to you know your spider sense that we okay we'll do that story but i never really got a full read about what was going on in his head because it seemed to change so constantly you see that you know Mercur mercurial is an understatement with that guy like he's just all over the map and he and he he'll say one thing and then 10 seconds later it will be the exact opposite um so i have no idea like what he was thinking um if he would if he would just be frozen in that go fuck yourself moment uh he'd be like a hero to mankind oh, yeah. right uh, yeah but if he it, it's the kowtowing and the cruelty and the stupid you know and the the shamelessness that's mixed in in between like i just don't understand the rest of that picture um well that's always so, so basically so elon is the green goblin you're saying yeah, he's a, a little bit, right? Yeah, like the, the Willem Dafoe thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's what's going on is that he's, he's, he's drinking the, the, the green enhancement fluid at night. Um, but, uh, you know, he, look, I, I'm sure he's got some very interesting, um, you know, sort of pharmaceutical, uh, you know, suppliers and but that can't be the entire explanation. Uh, he, he's a unique character. A lot of these people who are billionaires, they get to be um, because they have the, you know, they don't have to be grounded in reality like other people. Uh, right. It, yeah, they have people who will, who will say yes along the way, who will very much sort of like accommodate these whims. Like I used to deal, I never dealt with billionaires to my knowledge, but you know, Russell and I are both New York city tour guides. I was Russell still is the richest clients were always the craziest ones, always the most impulsive ones. They never paid yeah. attention. There was this one couple, not to get sidetracked, but they hired oh. me out to drive them around in private. And they were very, very nice to me. They paid me very well. They had their own driver, and I just sat in the passenger seat, and I directed the driver. And they said, they were from Sacramento, they say, we want the best New York pizza slice. Where do we get the best New York pizza slice? I said, well, the best slice in Manhattan, I think, for my money, is the Bleecker Street Pizza Nona slice. I don't know if you, ah, see, Matt's ah, Matt Ah, Matt knows. knows. Well, that's yeah. Jones, too, but, um. But, yeah. but that's a sit down pie place like the New York, yeah. like, like, yeah, the, the Nona at Bleecker Street is like a great grab and go Tuscan style. Slice. So I said, I, that's where I kind of want to take you because it's right in the middle of the village. We can do some cool sightseeing around there. Literally two minutes later, the guy's wife, we're going up Sixth Avenue and there's that Grimaldi's sort of kiosk restaurant in that church. You know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. right? And that, well, that used to be the limelight. Yeah, 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 exactly. And the guy, the guy's wife says, oh, Grimaldi's, I heard that's the best pizza in New York. Why don't we go there? And I, t I tell her, and I had never eaten a Grimaldi slice. I mean, it's fine. I guess I, I had it that day. I said, well, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I try to be polite. I said, well, you know, as I just said a few minutes ago, I want to take it to this other place that I think you'll like a little better, right? She says, okay, great. Uh, Jorge, whatever the driver's name, pull over. We're going here. As if I wasn't fucking talking to her. Like, right. like, I, like yeah. that, we go into the restaurant, we sit down, and the, the, the husband says, Keaton here, our tour guide, said, this is the best pizza in New York. <laughs> I've never fucking been here before. I, literally, I've not said any of this. Not zero. Zero. They, but, but they were very wealthy they obviously had no one in their lives who had any reason to like actually push back on anything they say so they right. just make up reality as they go along that's a personality type now elon may have some unique things going on but that's a type i recognize that type and it's a tech bro type too. move fast break things that was the ethos at facebook right just all impulse all ego don't think anything through make it up as you go along take a lot of chances we'll work it out as we go and some people are very successful at that yeah, yeah, it's it's grandiosity, narcissistic personality disorder. We're like, that's all familiar. Like most of us have, you know, dealt with the great Santini type somewhere along our lives. That like, you know, you don't have to have a billion dollars to be that. Um, right. right. But, 
what, what they add to it um, is like, you know, they can be very creative in their particular kind of lunacy. I mean, they, right. in addition to being, you know, having a personality disorder that freezes out other opinions, um, has no tolerance for uh, giving other people credit for things or, you know, whatever. They might actually think that, um, you know, if they spend enough money, they'll on some project that they can develop something that will keep them alive forever or that they'll be able to go, um, you know, faster than light speed and, and, you know, remain in perpetual motion and not never die. Like they, they have thoughts like this, right. Um, that are not like ours, you know, I, I, that, that was something that I didn't know until I started hanging around these tech folks. Um, some of the fantasies they have are pretty weird, but, uh, but also, but yeah, just their, 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 way of dealing with people it's it's not it's not just your traditional wall street dickhead uh, right. thing it's it's coded in this kind of like california nice yes thing, 100% yep right and but it's 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 phony um you know i actually prefer the, the you know the gordon gecko type who just tells you fuck you to your face and right um, is straight with you. It's just much easier to read who that person is. Now, they, they, they get, when money is on the line, that's when they get clever. Um, but it, it, these, the people in this tech world, that's, that's part of what's been so interesting about this project is that you, once you, you get past the personalities and ignore, if you can get into the documents and ignore what they're, what they're saying, that you can actually see what they're doing and what they're doing is just fucking horrifying. But you're right. It's, it, it's a personality type. It's just, it, in their case, it's a little more eccentric. Yeah. Well, whenever I'm dealing with people like that, I have, I, I understand Raymond Chandler's novels better. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's always about, you got invited to the house of these rich weirdos right? and you're going to yeah. delve into their dirty laundry and find out what they're really like. Right, yeah, they're they're in they're in a hot house surrounded by you know the world orchids. orchids. Yeah, exactly. And your sweat stains your. <laughs> that's a great scene. Big in the big in the big sleep. Uh, the think, big sleep. That's yeah, the opening yeah. scene. Robert Bogart did a great job with that one, but yeah, no, and and that hasn't changed. But I think what's what's different is that these people, um, there, there's an eccentricity. I mean there's this quasi religious thing that's going on that I don't fully understand, um, that, I, that I heard reference to a few times. Uh, you know, there's, there's a kind of mysticism, uh, involved. I never, because it wasn't relevant necessarily to what we were working on. I didn't pay a lot of attention to, but I heard some of this shit. Um, they're just weird, you know, but Elon is a special kind of weird on top of that. I just, that's all I'll say. Uh, did you did you ever see Oliver Stone did a mini series years ago that I often think of when a lot of this stuff comes up? It was called Wild Palms. No, what was it about? Okay, so it's it, it was really more and more ahead of its time the more I think about it. For one thing, it's got all it's set in L.A. and it's all these rich weirdos in L.A. and they have a religion that's clearly kind of inspired by Scientology. Right. But the thing the right. thing that always comes back to me is people had become so inoculated to the idea that they that the police state just comes and grabs people that they don't even pay attention so you'd have these scenes of people walking their poodles through through palm trees and you just have a black van pull up and grab somebody and throw them in and nobody would really <laughs> bat an eye at it <laughs> it almost seems like that's where we're going probably right i mean things the, I'm sure you've read the Gulag Archipelago books, right? Um, yeah. Solzhenitsyn, if I remember correctly, he tells a story about how the the, the NKVD or whatever they were before that, the Chaka, I think it was. Um, the Chaka, yeah. Read that they they would try all these different ways to grab people, like they had they hadn't perfected, or the, or they thought it was important to have lots of different ways so that you would be afraid all the time. Right. So they would come at your door at night, they would knock, uh, sometimes they wouldn't knock, and then sometimes they would just come at you from all angles on the, in the middle of the street, and 
you know, so that people could see that it could happen to you anywhere. Apparently, one woman was walking along the Arbat, in, which is like the South Street seaport of Moscow, basically. And they tried to arrest her, and she just jumped out on, a, on a, a light pole and grabbed hold of it and started screaming. And they got freaked out and, and didn't arrest her. Uh, <laughs> and, and she get, never got arrested. Um, so it was, it was a little quirk in the system. But uh, yeah, that's probably we're probably headed towards something like that. Well, as you mentioned earlier, we're just past like the one year anniversary of the Twitter files and um, volume one of the Twitter files. The subject uh, of that was, of course, the Hunter Biden laptop. And that came up again at the hearings. Uh, Dan Goldman apparently going down with the ship on that Hunter Biden laptop. Uh, let's take a look at this. Another piece of video I have. Look, this look at that highlight. segue. You can't yeah. teach that, man. You cannot teach that. That's skill. Yeah, no, it'd be, it'd be great if you didn't step on it. So when I clip it, I wouldn't have to do it over. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but thank you for the compliment. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's go to Dan Goldman talking about the Hunter Biden laptop. That the you are aware, of course, that the uh, laptop, so to speak, was actually that was published in the New York Post was actually a hard drive that the New York Post admitted here was not authenticated as real. It was not the laptop the FBI had. You're aware of that, right? It was the same contents. How do you know? Because, because it's the same, I mean, it's- You would have to authenticate it to know it was the same contents. contents. You have no idea. You know you hard drives can that be it's a conspiracy? manipulated. Are you suggesting the New York Post participated in a conspiracy to construct the contents of the Hunter Biden laptop? No, sir. The problem is that hard drives can be manipulated by Rudy Giuliani or Russia. Well, what's the evidence of that? that Rudy Giuliani well, can barely evidence. manipulate his zipper fly. He's going to manipulate a fucking hard drive on a laptop? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I should have said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he, he got it anyway here. Yeah. 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 Rudy Giuliani is going to manipulate a hard drive. <laughs> he knows how to create a copy of a hard drive. Unbelievable. All right, let's keep going. Of it, but the point is, it's There's not no the evidence for it, so you're engaged in a conspiracy. I'm glad theory. you agree with me, Mr. Schellenberger, that transparency is the most important thing. And my last question for you is, do you think it would right, be Right, like that's just a non sequitur the Hunter- way that he did it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He did it backwards. Right. Right, right, right. <laughs> Let me back that up a second just so we get that again. Are, are, you, are, you, are you telling me trust fund <laughs> Levi's heirs are not the best and the brightest? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you're engaging in a conspiracy. I'm glad theory. you agree with me, Mr. Schellenberger, that transparency <laughs> is the most important thing. And my What'd last question for you. So, so when he does that, when he does the I'm glad you agree with me, this right. This moment of panic flashes across his face as he as he realizes he forgot the setup. Right, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like that made no sense to me when I was watching that. And this clip went so viral, and I'm watching it, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, what did they edit something out? Like what? Like that makes yeah, there was just a complete leap, <laughs> a complete jump. Uh, all right, let's let's keep going. Is do you think it would be transparent? If Hunter Biden came to this Congress and testified in a public hearing and more transparent than if he testified privately. It's I mean, literally, I've never thought about that. I have no idea. <laughs> you don't know, literally never thought about that. Public the testimony time, more I mean, transparent than private testimony. Are you familiar with the first Mr. Amendment? Chairman, I yield back. The Congress shall take it, no action it, to abridge freedom of speech. Yeah. And, and that's what you just described. Mr. Schellenberger, is 13 percent censorship still censorship? Absolutely. And the other 87 percent is what we call the chilling effect that the courts have long recognized that they engaged in. You have that to, is the problem. There's a broad up. By the way, part of the operation, Congressman Holy Goldman, cow. part of the operation was to change the terms <laughs> of service. So you see them constantly trying to change the terms of service. You see them, it was 35% of of the URLs that were, this according to EIP, were labeled, removed, or soft blocked. That's all forms of censorship. That censorship is not just removal. But 65% were not. So how can the government be so, so, so coercive? So does the First what? Amendment think that's the about government for the course and government does efficiency? Does the First Amendment say the government this is how can censor? Stupid. This is how stupid the rich liberals of, of lower Manhattan are, that they voted for this idiot because he held Trump accountable during the impeachment. Held him accountable for what? The guy, he, Trump got away with everything during the impeachment. <laughs> right. I mean, look, 
He's on the verge of getting (laughs) reelected. Yeah, and he's going to get (laughs) reelected. Right, exactly. In a landslide uh, next year. I mean, look, I'm not a Democrat. I I wash my hands of this. But as Democrats go, they had Yuli New. They had Mondaire Jones. Even Bill de Blasio was in the race for a while. He'd have been better. This guy is an absolute clown. Just a ridiculous person. Just a totally fucking ridiculous person. 65% of the request. What the hell are you? 60? That means 35%. You made that point, I think, Matt, because I can, you can kind of hear you in the background at the end of this. But do you want to add anything before we play the rest? Well, it's just uh, uh, in the entire universe of things that you could bring up. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. The question uh, the thing you to bring up is... Um, the proof that they, they <laughs> censor in 35% case, <laughs> right. like, you know, that's just leading with your face in a boxing match. I mean, yeah. it, this guy's a lawyer. Like he, what lawyer does, what lawyer introduces that? Um, you know, I don't know. It was amazing. And so the, yeah, we were trying to get on, on his case and, um, and uh, I yelled out something about it being, you know, we have 35% of a First Amendment, but M- Michael made the same point. And, yeah, uh, here, I'll play the rest of it, because I hear your voice at the end of this. The time of the gentleman has expired. They're not censoring. They're flagging in the social Chair media companies. So it, under the only action, 35% of a First Chair, Amendment? Or? Chair it's not the First Amendment. It's the terms of service, as you said, and they oh. are flagging it for the social media companies to make their own decisions. That is not the First Amendment. That is the terms of service. Well, just I seen mean, that you're an attorney, you know that almost the four too federal judges absurd are... to respond to. <laughs> I know, and and again, and I, and I made the point to him. It's like four federal judges have already said that it's you know that that is censorship, um, and he knows very well what all the cases are. I'm I'm assuming. Uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I have that. Sorry, yeah. I cut that off too soon. Hold but on. it's on I appeal in front of, of the Supreme Court. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, just seen the- Congressman, you're an attorney. You know that the four federal judges have already ruled that. The- and I know that it's on appeal in front of the Supreme Court right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where it's certainly going to win, right? <laughs> With, like, like what? Well, I mean, not, it, may, it may not, but still, I mean, it's very, it's very amusing to see the, the, the a Democrat put all of his trust in the Supreme no, Court. No, well, that, that's what right. I mean. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, and to go like Schultz and Plaskett already, they had enough with the last one. They got they got laughed at too much. They left you alone. So he decides he's gonna he's gonna be the hero. He's gonna go for you guys. And he picks the very well litigated Hunter Biden laptop, he, he, every, arguing that it might be fake or tampered with. Like even the Post had to admit that it was real. The Post, the New York about? Times, fucking Politico. I mean, there everybody was a thought about it. Um, you know, Glenn did some of it. I mean, the the but even the most mainstream organizations have, have already said you know we we made the call we we found the other people on the on the end of these emails like it's all this is real um and he, for him to like, he actually says you would have to verify that like it's been done it's been very right. <laughs> right. <laughs> is he talking yeah. right so, so like one line after the other is like false like 100% it, 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 you know if it was a copy for a news story, you'd have to like strike through the entire thing. You'd have like, you know, Mr. Schellenberger and then thank you at the end. That's what would be left, you know? Uh, <laughs> but he fucked up every single line there. Um, <laughs> uh, and it, we actually, I don't, I don't know if I talked to Schellenberger about this, but I, but I have been trying to needle him um, like over and over again because I have a few, I've always had the sense that he's dumb enough to say something like revealing. Um, so I, occasionally I'll try to tweet at him and, and uh, give him a hard time. I think he just takes this shit personally. I've actually heard in private that he's a nice guy. Uh, so that's kind of surprising. But he comes off as a total doofus, as you see. So, uh, yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. Amazing well, stuff. Um, I think we got a couple more things. Um, if, if you have time, I don't want to keep you all night. Um, yeah, sure, we're good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, right. Go ahead. So the aforementioned uh, Missouri versus Biden. All right. So uh, 
most of our folks probably know, but in case you don't, this is the case that was brought by the attorney generals of Missouri and Louisiana against the Biden administration for allegedly, we'll use that word, violating the First Amendment and its contacts with uh, tech companies like Twitter. Uh, it could determine the future of speech online, the future of sites like yours, shows like ours. Um, after the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals struck down six of the seven injunctions put in place by a district court judge, the administration still decided to take the case to the Supreme Court, which you decided as a nerd, I appreciated the reference, the Borg making a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. what, so what did you mean? How did the Borg make a mistake by taking this to SCOTUS instead of just letting sleeping dogs lie? Well, the, the, the thing is that the even if there is an injunction by a district court saying nobody can talk to these people for any reason, um, the appellate court cut out right. the broadness of that ruling and limited it basically to saying you have to follow the law, um, which they were already violating. So if they were being smart, they, they could have just said, Oh gosh, yeah. Well, we, you know, we're sorry. We'll stop doing that and just continue doing the same shit. There's no enforcement mechanism in there. Like, the, you know, the, those judges aren't going to demand a, you know, it's it's not that kind of settlement, right? Where they where they would have had to report, um, you know, on a, on a regular basis. So, but you know, the the plaintiffs lawyers thought after the the appellate court ruled that way that they would not be able to politically allow uh, a judgment that said that the Biden administration violated the First Amendment to stand. And they were right. Um, where I got, where I screwed up is I assumed that it would, if it went up to the Supreme Court, that it was going to win. Um, now I hear that actually there's a real, very real possibility that it could lose up there. Uh, and that they, they may even need one of the liberal judges to defect in order to get it um, because, well, for a variety of reasons, but am among other things, because uh, I mean, how many, how many serious rulings against uh, the department of defense um, have you seen from that court? Like not many, some of the judges apparently are very shaky on this issue. So uh, I thought they screwed up by sending it to the Supreme court, but, um, but maybe they didn't. See, I would have thought the same thing, mm -hmm. that this court is definitely going to rule against them. But you're saying that's a much dicier proposition than at first glance. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking, <laughs> to, you know, there, there, there are a lot, obviously the plaintiffs, lawyers, there's a, there's a, a lot of people are involved in this case. There's a lot of eyes in this thing. Um, you know, I might be contributing to an amicus brief uh, about it. We've talked to a bunch of lawyers. Some lawyers have thought about joining on to an amicus brief and decided not to because, among other things, because they, they weren't sure that it was going to win. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know a whole lot about how the Supreme Court works. I mean, if there's the whole criminological aspect to this um, that, you know, I, I've never had to cover anything involving them, but apparently uh, it's not a sure thing. Um, and you well, know, there's also a ticking clock, right? I mean, that's the other part. Like, they would want to get this settled before the election, right? Because, I mean, if the Biden administration were going to lean on social media companies to censor content they don't like, they'd want to do it before November of next year, not after. Uh, so the timeline is a factor, too. I don't know how that works when they're going to rule. Yeah, but even, even, if, even if there's a brutal ruling saying, like, you can't have um, you, you can't do all these things. There's still no enforcement mechanism. Uh, you have to remember they're already they were already right, that's actively violating the law. And even if the Supreme Court says the Department of Homeland Security can't uh, get involved in uh, domestic elect or electoral issues, um, you know, or call that cybersecurity or whatever. Um, you know, who's going to say that the, you'd need another executive branch agency to enforce that. And the problem is the whole executive branch is, is in on this. So, right. you know, that, yeah, that's right. true. <laughs> that's the other thing. Yeah. And even if they did enforce it, then the ticking clock becomes an issue again, because 
by the time you get through appealing that and, you know, OK, now that we, we, we went through this process of setting the rules, then somebody breaks the rules, even if there is somebody who's willing to blow the whistle on it, which is doubtful. Um, at that point, you have to see whether or not they actually did break the rules. At that point, we're well past November of next year. Right. right. Like they'll be able to just push this past the election either way. Right. The one good piece of news is that from what I understand, there there is no election integrity partnership type thing in the works right now. Um, there, you know, they had a second one. They had they had a smaller scale version for 2022, but there's nothing that I know of uh, for 2024 set up. But as we saw, they can do they they can do these things pretty quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. So I mean, the the last one, the one in 2020, that you know, the idea for it was in April and they had it up and running by, you know, August. So yeah, we'll see. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people have very high hopes for that case. I'm very glad that it's, you know, the plaintiffs, Jay Bhattacharya and Martin Kaldorf and Eric Cariati, they're the perfect plaintiffs because, you know, not only, you know, do they have a very, um, is there a lot of documentary evidence in their cases, but they they were, they turned out to be right. Um, and that's going to be a hard thing for judges to sw- to look past if it ever gets to that. Uh, right, Russell, so- did you get your CT, uh, your CLIT question in, or, uh, did you want to do that one? I, d- I do want to do that one. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, <laughs> In conjunction with uh, Public last week, you broke the story of Cyber Threat Intelligence League, otherwise known as CLIT. This is what <laughs> this is what you had to say about them. <laughs> you said, I don't favor censorship, but if I did, I'd want to be sure the people doing it did not all come from the same economic and educational background. That's clearly the case with CLIT and others like it. These folks come from the same schools and tax bracket. They vomit out the same prefab Flaubertian uh, bourgeois idiocies, inhabit the same informational bubble, and boast the same immunity to proletarian frustrations, read reality. Uh, And you also said something similar, although I'm taking this from your article. I I think you changed it a little in your statement, but in your um, written version of your statement. Uh, for Congress. You said, take away the highfalutin talk about countering hate and reducing harm and anti-disinformation is just a bluntly elitist gatekeeping exercise. If you prefer to think in progressive terms, it's class war. So can you explain what this organization is and why you believe the war on disinformation at this point? I haven't really heard you use this language very much before, but it seems to be a conclusion you're coming to now, that it's really about class. Well, uh, you know, that's one of the things that happens is when you cover something, it, it takes a long time to see the whole picture sometimes, right? Sure. Uh, you know, when I did the Wall Street thing, it was I was probably two or three years into it before I fully understood the whole scam, you know, of right. mortgage-backed securities. Here, uh, you know, it, it takes a while to see that, um, that, well, first of all, let's get, what is what is CTI League? CTI League was um, sort of a precursor to the Election Integrity Partnership or the Reality Project, and it was... Um, Designed by this very eccentric British woman named Sarah Jane Turp, S.J. Turp. She's a a data scientist and former British defense analyst. She worked at a company called, an uh, open source company called Ushahidi. Uh, Started there in February of 2014. Uh, Another person who joined at that exact same time was a person named Jonathan Morgan, who was the CEO of a company called New Knowledge which um, was the Senate uh, analyst for the Russian bot uh, report, but they also uh, did that phony deal where they created fake Russians uh, in the Alabama Senate race, and then they were behind Hamilton 68 as well. So there's a weird Hamilton 68 connection with these people. Anyway, she, in in conjunction with this um, defense official named Pablo Brewer, they set up uh, sort of a volunteer uh, review group to look at uh, ostensibly just COVID misinformation. Um, but we had a, a whistleblower came forward to Michael basically 
with all the documents from that group. And what we learn is that basically they, this volunteer private organization was basically created because DOD, DHS, and Global Engagement Center, and even the CIA and NSA can't do it legally. And so they, you create these kind of quasi-private structures through which the censorship is done. You guys know the basic thing. But the thing that, you know, and this is the punchline, I think, for all the stuff since the Twitter files is, when you get right down to it, all these programs are very similar. It, they're, they, it, they're run by the same group of people. They go back and forth between media, intelligence, and government. Um, but they all went to the same Ivy League schools that we talked about. The, and they all, the, the one thing they all have in common is none of them come from hard, you know, hardship, right? There, 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 don't, there are no ordinary people involved in doing this work. And that's kind of crucial to understand. It's like you, you, ha you have to be credentialed to get into this thing. Um, and it's almost like having a literary literacy test for voting. Like if, there's a reason why that was a fucked up idea. Well, this is the same thing. Like you're you're not going to get to be censoring content unless you um, you know the EU has very specific language about what what kind of you have to be credentialed to be what they call a trusted flagger. Um, and I, you know I did a, a FOIA request on one of these programs, and even just to do the grunt work of cleaning up the material for the reviewers, you had to have a bachelor's degree. The people who did the actual reading had to have master's degrees. So it's it's going to be sort of affluent professional class and uh, you know people all around the world censoring everybody else. And that's that's kind of the key I think to understanding this whole thing. CTI League is important just because it uh, additionally because it gives us a window into this other universe of shit that we didn't see in the Twitter files which is the offensive stuff where they fake news stories and invent things and create sock puppet accounts and stuff like that. Uh, we're going to probably learn that they do that a lot more than we thought, but, um, but you know, that's coming still. So. Well, one, one of the things that really struck me in your article, because you guys got a lot of footage of them and audio of them talking. What often strikes me about people with these credentials and these degrees is that fundamentally they're dumb as dog shit and as boring as milk. <laughs> They, they are just the flattest, most uninteresting people. And you really get the sense that they cling so tightly to mores because they have nothing interesting to say. They would have nothing to say if they weren't spouting platitudes and, and gatekeeping and telling other people what to do. Like, what, what do they have to recommend them? How could they possibly gain any power other than to suck on to social values and appoint themselves to enforce them? I mean, Why yeah, do they want to pay attention to them? I mean, there, there's a woman in one of the videos named Deb Lavoie who was part of this thing called the reality team. And she she says things like, yeah, I don't know a whole lot, but I know about narratives. Yeah. Uh, and, and then they have no problem editing or, or reviewing people who have PhDs and, you know, biological sciences, even though they don't know anything themselves. And then they come out and say things like, well, we're just doing, we're going to do the same things that the bad guys do, but we're going to do it for good reasons. Um, so, you know, the, that's when you start getting into creating sock puppet accounts and uh, creating distractions so that people can't read what they, what they deem to be harmful material. And that's, that's why this, this, this stuff is so dangerous, because it's not just suppressing, um, you know, true content. They're also going to be kind of fundamentally altering reality in other ways by introducing all kinds of, you know, fake stuff into into the ether, and we'll have no way of figuring out what it is at a certain point. I mean, right now we're, you know, all trying as hard as we can to point it out. I mean, you guys do it. Everybody, the, the whole alternative media is very right now focused on, you know, identifying fake stuff and exploding it, uh, but. You know, you can't get everything, and then pretty soon they're going to be able to get, do this so well that it'll be impossible to detect. That's what that's what's scary about it. Well, if there's a, if there's an element of hope, it is how dumb this yeah, audio yeah. 
exposes yeah. them as. So you actually have audio there where they're trying to figure out how you determine if a medical research report is actually oh wrong and nobody knows. And they're asking, so uh, how do you, um, are there are there places you can look to find that out? <laughs> and the person they turn to as like the experts like, yeah, there are places you can go. So just <laughs> look yeah. for them. There, there are academic paper places. <laughs> These are the people. I mean, that's what's that's what's so fucking terrifying. I mean, uh, and I was saying this to Walter. It's it's a little bit like the end of the trial when he the guy, he gets dragged away for execution and he sees that it's like these three pot belly dumb actors who are taking him away to be executed. Um, you know, underneath the surface of these highly sophisticated programs are these absolute fucking idiots, and it, it's it's a little hard to accept at first, but it, it's a it's fundamental to understanding this whole thing. You know, I interviewed a lot of the military folks who do the who did the counterterrorism stuff. Um, that they built a lot of these tools. Those people were smart. Like they, they were in, you know, they were out there doing battle with, you know, ISIS and Al Qaeda and whatever you might think of them morally. They actually understood, you know, I mean, like they these were these are smart people, right? Like right, right. these people are idiots. These, these are busybodies, right? Yeah, they and they came from like corporate marketing. They're like you know, software marketing executives. If you notice in that, in those, in those videos, the one person who doesn't sound like a total idiot is the DOD guy. Um, and that's consistent with what we've seen, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what's terrifying about this is that the, on the domestic s speech suppression front, you're going to see all these people who have no real life experience editing, you know, becoming editors in chief of the universe. And that's the future. Uh, which is great, you know. Well, you, I, and you had, I think this was, this was my favorite one, and this was kind of the star piece. You have, like, the ultimate shit lib bitching about her shit lib in-laws. Oh, my for, God. For not, for not being informed <laughs> enough. Like, I, I think if there's any satisfaction here, it's what the release of this material has done to her family dynamics. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, she, I, she goes she goes on about how her in-laws are liberals, but they only regurgitate what they get from TV. And what they really need is to be programmed by the likes of her. Right. So that they can better argue their liberal positions and not just be on autopilot. She even has some kind of quote in there, like, if, if you can even call it thinking, or like, if you can even call it, I, if their ideas, if you can even call them. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's something like so fucking insulting. It's going to be a very awkward Christmas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought about that. I thought it, you, you don't often get a chance to to send an you know a cruise missile directly into somebody's family, but um, you know, <laughs> look, I would have I would I would have preferred to interview this person and find out what her, what she's thinking, but you know they they didn't want to talk to us. So, um, and and by the way, that stuff was public anyway. Uh, you know, we got it from a whistleblower, but they left it online also uh so it's not our fault that it's out there uh but yeah and then we this, this, by the way that wasn't the only one there's another one where she's talking about her son um and you know about how he thinks everything is bullshit uh and he's just a nihilist and you know we need to do we, we need to find you know sort of easier ways to penetrate minds like his and stuff like that there's a lot of that stuff that goes on. These people are very, very affected by their interactions, but with their relatives, which should tell you a lot. Like, you're you're going to decide the information landscape for the entire world based on how your, you know, holiday dinner went. I mean, really. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, people are like that. It's it's just crazy, and and that's why that that's um, by the way, that's one of the reasons why we're getting calls from some of the military folks is because they're losing their mind seeing this stuff being applied over here. Like, you know, we didn't spend 20 years designing these evil weapons to have them put in the hands of people like this, you know? Uh, so yeah, that, well, that, that's a point Chris Hedges always makes that eventually the things that they do overseas will be used against the population. Always. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I I guess naively, I didn't, I didn't expect that 
that would happen. But um, no, I did. You know, I mean, I, I, I at least at least theoretically, I thought it could. But I I never thought it would come that like so directly. And that and that is the, the story of this. This is the war on terror come home, and we're just seeing what it looks like. You know, I mean, we haven't. The, the, Walter talks a lot about how the we haven't had the first domestic droning yet, um, but it's probably not far off, I would imagine. So, um, you know, we'll come to that. But yeah, those documents are amazing for just for sheer humor value. Uh, if your listeners haven't checked them out, I would strongly recommend it. Definitely check those out at Racket. Um, if I might suggest a title for your follow up, The Banality of Shit Lips. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> um, we just got one more uh, little uh, question slash uh, segment for you on a slightly different um, topic. But you wrote a, a quick piece recently about the economy and how, according to you know both Joe Biden and Biden supporting pundits, um, the American people are too stupid to understand how well off they are <laughs> financially. And um, you even compared Paul Krugman to Thomas Friedman, and I know your work well enough to know that you did not mean that as a compliment. So uh, do you want to explain what you mean uh, by that um, and how this White House and their minions in the press are actually trying to gaslight people into thinking that the economy is actually great? It, so the basis of that was a, was a Guardian poll about attitudes how people how people themselves felt about the economy so you're you're polling people not about you're not asking them is inflation going up and down you're not asking them to I, correctly identify macroeconomic factors or whatever it is how do you feel about the economy are things good or bad right and the answer comes back it's bad right like a lot of people are very anxious about it and and uh it, it, there, the attitudes are moving in a direction of more heightened concern rather than the other way. And first the Guardian and then Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman has repeatedly told people that they are, they, they are engaging in falsehoods about their own feelings. Um, and, you know, they, they write this stuff and they don't know how it sounds, right? Like, and this is something that's been true since... You got. You both know this since the Trump years. This is this has been the theme of you know coverage of what the great unwashed is like. They 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 don't really have these feelings of anger and frustration. They're just wrong, and they just need to be told that more often. Um, and once they hear it enough times, they'll stop being dissatisfied. I mean. Do they really think that's going to work? Uh, and the the only way the only way you can think that that's going to work is if you've never had any interaction ever with people who you know are really mad in that way. You know, I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? I I just find that shit amazing. I uh, personally want to read that. It's it's stunning. I mean, it's it's a real head scratcher. I mean, it's the same sort of blindness that we saw in 2016, which is when Trump won the first time uh were it not for the pandemic i think trump certainly would have won the second time and now he's likely going to win the third time <laughs> you know what i mean so i mean it's just i mean talk about trying to force a square peg into a, a round hole the the whole narrative that inflation's gone down well the, the rate of inflation's gone down but look my day job until we started doing well with this show and i still do it from, t from time to time to supplement i shop instacart i spend I used to spend eight hours a day in a fucking grocery store. Inflation has not gone down. <laughs> the, 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 maybe the rate has gone down. Shit is still through the roof. I mean, it is just impossible to buy things. You can't fill a grocery bag for less than eighty dollars. Um, so, I, like, I, I don't know much Every of the bacon, same way. Bacon, egg, and cheese reality, in Harlem, six dollars. Yeah, unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Like, I, in, much in the same way that the israel gaza war is just too in people's faces to the point where they can't possibly ignore or get the wrong idea about what is actually happening because we see the photos and the videos you can't gaslight people about the economy in this way because when they go to the store and they fill a bag of groceries they know how much it costs and they know that that makes it impossible to live no i mean you there is no you have to make a ton of money now just to live a working class lifestyle there is no middle class lifestyle anymore 
No, no. I mean, anything goes wrong in America, it's five thousand dollars. That's just, that's the that's the starting price for right. something something off schedule happening, like getting a dent of your car, or whatever it is, right? My kid's had a health scare. He spent three days in the hospital. That bill alone, with insurance through my wife's work, is $2,200. That's not counting the specialist follow-ups that we had to do or the primary care or the Medicaid, this and that. I mean, luckily, thank God, he's okay, which is the most important thing. But like you said, something like that happens out of nowhere. Boom. Now you got bills out your ass that you're going to be paying off for years. Right. And, and they know, and people like Paul Krugman, they know because the Fed puts out this data every six months or whatever, that half the country doesn't have $400, right? right? 400 extra dollars. So like in this environment, um, the, it, it's obvious that there's going to be an enorm enormous amount of dissatisfaction. But on top of that, it's just writing it the way that, or saying it the way that they do, it, it, you know, um, it, you your your feelings about the economy are incorrect you know you, or your your frustration is wrong um it, it, that's not actual rhetoric that's not that's not a way to convince people right that's just being insulting it's like i i don't respect your point of view or your perspective that's what you're really saying and that just makes people more angry and that's why you're seeing the snowballing thing where people are going to be like i'll vote for donald for Donald Trump, if he's in jail um, and you know tied to a hundred, you know chained to a hundred cinder blocks, like I, just to see the look on your face when he gets elected, that's what people are going to be thinking right. all day. Right. If you keep this shit up, and they don't get it, you know. So, but we could we could go on about this forever. But all of these things are just—it's a replay of the same error over and over and over again and um yeah it's it's infuriating to, to read uh definitely yeah, and to bring the talk back to academia and i was in college the economic textbook that i was forced to buy for however many hundreds of dollars guess who wrote that paul krugman hey, he's a textbook really? author yeah he's a textbook <laughs> author yeah so he has so he so he's got kind of like a guaranteed income scam Right. Oh, yeah, no, that's how he makes his money. It, right. Hack hack teachers force, you know, 19 year olds to buy his book for three his books for 300 bucks a piece. Yeah. Take out loans to do it, probably. <laughs> yeah, take out loans to buy his right. books to learn about how great they have it. Yeah. I mean, doesn't that make you just want to walk up to the person and slap him? Like, and that's, you know, I mean, I, I just feel like these people don't, they don't realize how, how insulting that is. And how much that will motivate people to do just about anything except support you politically. Like when you when you do that stuff like that, this is unbelievable. Um, now you got me all up. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> See, and, and and we thought that was like a mellow question. Yeah, we thought <laughs> to that bring, was, yeah. To, to bring in the land of God. I I think it's a combination of things. I think partly it's what Thomas Frank said. I always show people this great clip he did an interview with a French magazine uh, about why trump won and towards the end of the interview he says it's a short clip about 10 minutes and he says the the hillary generation cannot admit that they were wrong they cannot admit that their entire political project was a mistake they can't right. so no. a lot of what you see with someone like krugman who's from that generation it's the sunk cost fallacy. It's we went so far in this direction, the ramifications of admitting that it was all a horrible mistake to our professional reputations, to our lives. Like, what if we were to actually reverse course? What would that mean for me? Because I've made out well in this turn, right? I wouldn't do very well in a more fair society, would I? So they have to defend neoliberalism. And if you're not going to offer the people anything, all you can offer them is scorn at that point right. for so rejecting you. Thomas Frank, what, what, what is it? A nation of skull or uh, it's like a nation of scolding or um, I forget what the term is. You're talking yeah, about yeah, what are the columns, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but but that that's what that's what it is it's scolding right like that's even krugman's column it's a scolding column no 
you're, I, the experts scold you for having the wrong opinion. And you're right. Yeah. Like they, they can't back up. They can't say they're wrong. And, you know, Thomas is, he was one of the first people to see this stuff coming. And isn't it a coincidence that he got exiled? Uh, oh, yeah. too, you know? I mean, it's just, these people are unerring in their instincts for, you know, avoiding truth. Uh, so yeah. And they, they, there's, there's no way back for them, but you know, except for, more of these tools of control and that that's why that this is i think the next next part of that story Ugh. no absolutely yeah. absolutely right all right well you can check out matt's new Substack, rape and murder dot substack dot com <laughs> exciting new live streams every week yeah. can i say one last thing sure that's why yeah. these, that's why they fund so many zombie movies because they know right like if they if they make even one concession or admit even one thing that that's the next step is like, like nope. you know, the whole world is going to, nope. it's going to pour in through their, their, their doorway and just start eating their faces off. Um, <laughs> and, you know, they're absolutely right about that. So, you know, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 you know, I, I have a different read on the zombie genre. Right? Really? I think it, I, yeah. I think it became so popular because we hate the civilization we've built so much that the fantasy of returning to tribal circumstances oh, where true. we're valued for who we are and for our core ethics and decency is is so appealing to us where you're just fighting off predators with people who love you and who have your back right so that's like the world where that, that's like the uh walking uh the walking dead walking dead version where it's like yeah we're, we're that's sort of like the incredible hulk script where um, you know you're sort of wandering through the wilderness, making friends or whatever it is, and you're surrounded by hostiles. Yeah, you're right about that. But I still think there's uh, there's an upper class uh, terror fantasy underneath a lot of the zombie shit. Uh, and well, the, I... the vampire thing is the opposite. That that's the that's the we're beautiful and we'll, we're going to live forever thing um you know that that's like self-congratulatory but that's another topic for another show yeah, I, yeah. I hope well, you're, you're we'll right. have to bring you in on our next annual halloween episode <laughs> oh man oh uh, god tell, tell people where they can find you before you before you head out yeah i'm at racket.news thanks everybody and my god we talked for two and a half hours my kids are going to uh uh, I'm, I'm gonna go face the music upstairs. Thanks, thank you, Joe. We, we, we appreciate you giving us so much of your time, man. Okay. Have a pleasure. Good show. Congratulations on your on the success with the show. It's, it's great. So. Thank you so much, man. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Matt. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Matt Taibbi, everybody. What a show that was, man. Yeah, that was that nah, was. I, uh, I, I, I mean, we always have fun with Matt. Yeah, no, he, he's a great guy, great guest, great interview. I knew that would be. A great one, and I think it was. Came out pretty damn good. All right, folks, um, we are going to take some super chats, take some Rumble rants, and then we got a Q&A after the show over on rumble.com front slash do dissidents. But, Jake, uh, if you are there, uh, why don't you hit the Patreon scroll, my friend? Our Patreon supporters and paid Substack subscribers and paid locals members are the backbone of this show. So you can help support what we do here by going to patreon.com front slash do dissidents and signing up. We are approaching 500 paid subscribers, at which point we can afford to add a fourth weekly stream. Those will be Thursdays. We decided rather than do them at 9 a.m. and make them one hour, we'll do them at 12 p.m. Because we don't want to uh, go on while our friend Kit over at Hardlands Media is on. But he's usually wrapped by about noon. So if we figure if we start at noon, that gives us a little extra time in case we have more stuff to cover. So those will be our fourth streams when we do them. But we need to get to 500 paid members in order to add them because 
as I mentioned to Matt, my day job is driving groceries and uh, lunch orders. And so um, we're, we're, we're living the, the glamorous life. I'm living the glamorous <laughs> life. So uh, another show midday is another day I can't do my day job. Uh, and Russell, same thing. Russell works tour gigs, you know, um, as his supplemental gig now. And so those are gigs Russ can't do and gigs I couldn't do. So we need to get to 500 subscribers before we can finance that. So if you want to help us out, go to patreon.com front slash do dissidents. When you do, you get call in access to our uh, Q&A's every Sunday night over on Rumble. You also get your name up in lights here on the patron scroll. And you get, uh, most importantly, most fun, uh, two bonus shows per month. We do sh two full-length live streams per month exclusively for our paid members. So you can go to patreon.com front slash do dissidents, do dissidents.substack.com or do dissidents.locals.com. If you're watching over there on Rumble right now, we got a bunch of you guys in there. Uh, you can hit that join button right underneath the screen, sign up on Locals. Perks are the same for all three. Um, so it's, you know, your choice, wherever you want to sign up. Uh, but it really does help us out uh, a great deal. And once we get to 500, which we're closing in on, we're somewhere in the 460s right now, uh, we will add that fourth weekly streams. So we certainly hope to be there before the end of the year. Um, all right, folks, let's take some super chats before we get out of here. And then post show Q and a is over on rumble.com front slash do dissidents. Best fast food hash browns. Yeah, that became a thing. Thanks, Brits, man. My wife offered me a McDonald's hash brown <laughs> when we were on the show on uh, Friday, and that became a big topic. I saw a lot of comments. Keaton, how could you eat McDonald's hash browns? They are connected to Israel I somehow, mean, so those I should are fucking, them. I, those are pretty nasty, man. It's potatoes. What do you mean? How is it, na how is it nastier than like a frozen uh, tater tot? I mean, it's not. I wouldn't eat that either. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck They're yeah. both fucking nasty. <laughs> Hard cuisine over here. <laughs> Can't eat a tater tot. All right. Hey man, Best... I've been, as you can hear from my voice, I've been living on tea and <laughs> yeah. all, the, all the sick person food, canned <laughs> soup, peanut butter, and jelly. I've been eating all that shit for the last day. Every, everyone turns into a six-year-old all of a sudden when they get sick. Start yeah, eating the shit your mother used to make for chicken you Chicken soup. Sick. Yeah. It's like stuck in your head. To answer your question, Brits, man, I think McDonald's is the best fast food hash brown, I gotta say. Um, much love to you all, says Rifsai. Uh, but I have to go see Godzilla minus one. Vote Godzilla. Yeah, man, I've heard, I've heard world. good things. Lot yeah, the trailer looks really great, good. actually. Yeah. I'm a sucker for monster movies, so I like Godzilla movies. And yeah, it looks really good. The trailer looked looked pretty slamming, pretty banging. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the movie. But thanks for the donation. Uh, this is a tough name to say on purpose, but thank you for the super sticker. Thanks for the ten dollars. <laughs> and Dave Tillery says, "Russ, you're muted." Just kidding. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you, Dave. Appreciate that very much. Abiding. Thanks for the ninety-nine cent super sticker. Appreciate that, my friend. Hobbs forty-five says, "As a form of protest, the CIA is refusing to write editorials for the New York Times until their circulation goes over five hundred. <laughs> thank you, Hobbs. Appreciate that." donation and that comment all right uh let's give our rumble rant there's a little bit of love over here uh let's see we got some uh joe mama thanks for the one dollar i often start late and catch up at one and a half speed you guys got to hear the schmata rap sped up <laughs> that shit slaps yeah we should do the schmata rap actually jake can you queue up the the merch page um we won't hit it right away but we'll hit it before the end of the show um thank you and have about a round of applause for jake in the booth this evening did a wonderful job moderating the chat and fielding these rumble rants so how about a round of applause for our producer friend jake south jersey guy uh i was a little concerned about a comment russell made on the friday morning show during the malay segment uh -oh. Could you both clarify? Was it the seventies exploitation thing? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, come could on, you both he's got clarify that look. your positions on the WEF anthropogenic climate change narrative. Um, so the Friday morning show would that have been the Malay segment, or didn't we do a carbon capture segment on Friday? We morning, did a carbon capture else? segment. Maybe that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So when people say like the climate change Malay. agenda is is bogus, uh, that's different in my mind from saying that climate change doesn't exist. Like I think climate right. change is real. Exactly. I think a lot of the proposed solutions 
are new world order screw jobs that uh, do more to consolidate power and resources and less to actually uh, <laughs> slow the the train of environmental degradation. So I hope that's um, clear. I mean, I think that's pretty clear on my part. Exact, exactly what he said. You know, you know, it's scary, man. The other when we were backstage at Jimmy's the other day, I started singing this like '70s song, and then Keaton was thinking of. A song that was very similar. I was like, you know, that's what happens when you're working together four years, man. No, it was the Four Seasons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, I was singing. He um, starts singing, "I love you, baby," and I had right. in my head at the exact same time, "What a lady, what a night." It was like the same. <laughs> it, was, it, was it was one crazy. of those things, man. That yeah. does happen when you're working together for a while. Yeah, indeed. I'll, I'll, uh, t- I'll tell you something trippy here. Hold so, on. Before you do that, Jake says that the Rumble has earned their 666 since we have over 666 in the Rumble chat. So go ahead. Um. So, yeah. So the Navy, they a lot of you guys probably know about this. So the Navy it, uh, researched psychic phenomena for like decades, right? And they stopped doing it. Not because they concluded it didn't work. They just concluded it wasn't actionable enough to um, to really use in a military context. Um, but yeah, remote viewing, all of this stuff. But they found when people did creative work together, like if you had people draw together or sing together, their psychic connection went up. And anybody who's done theater, that makes total sense. Because you start saying shit at the same time with people, right. like they know what you're thinking. There must thinking, have been some cue back in the conversation like that. that led both of us to think Four Seasons. There must have been something there, whether it was subconscious or whatever, that, that led us that way. Maybe. Uh, some RD, thanks for the four ninety nine. What are Matt's thoughts on the Palestine censorship on Twitter? Well, we talked about the Palestine censorship on campus quite a bit. Twitter, to Elon's uh, credit, we talked quite I mean, a lot about that. We talked, we did talk uh, quite a lot about that. And uh, for all Elon's, uh, you know, whimsical tweet about banning from the river to the sea, I don't know of anyone who's actually been banned for saying it. I know a lot of people said that on purpose after he announced that rule just to see if yeah, he'd back it up. Yeah, I don't think he enforced it. I don't think it's been enforced. <laughs> yeah. Because the kind you. of motherfuckers we know would have been kicked off already. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, Let's go back to some uh, Rumble Rants. Joe Mama canceled my Breaking Point subscription. Figured Jimmy is rich enough. DD and Racket are the only media supports I'm sticking with until civilization collapses. <laughs> I also love 90s hip hop. Well, thank you. Thank you. For that, thank Joe you. Mama. Uh, appreciate your support. Uh, let's see here. Blank State. Thanks for the two bucks. Mr. T, next time, please ask Miss Plaskett if she. <laughs> intensifies as sis or sisa thank you for that um mac truck thanks for the five dollars to paraphrase lewis h latham our common ground and moral code is political we protect the other person's liberty in the interest of protecting our own Mehdi hassan just got an education yeah that's what i love about Matt. you know i wasn't planning on asking matt about elon just because i figured that was pretty raw and you know i mean it's one thing to be a gossip mongering J O O. It's another thing to like go really there. But then he started kind of bringing it up. I figure, all right, I yeah. guess he's comfortable talking about it, so I went for it, exactly. and that was a good, uh, good part of it. Uh, I like this one. War in Westell lives on. Keaton will be voting for Doctor Shiva. You know, I gotta tell you, my friend. No lie, I might be voting for Doctor Shiva. I'm not necessarily opposed to voting for him. I just don't want to talk to him because he seems like an asshole. <laughs> but I might vote for him. I mean, whatever. As long as I don't have to talk to him. <laughs> We're not interviewing him. I'll but, vote for uh, him as long as he doesn't campaign. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll vote for him if you guys stop begging me to interview him. How's that? <laughs> if we don't have to interview him, we'll vote Do we have him. a deal? Do we, does that sound like a plan? Uh, long story short, thanks to the $2. So-called journalist. Yeah, Mehdi yeah. Hassan. Pat yeah. Donahue, Solidarity Brothers. Thank you, Patrick. Late out there in Ireland, but thank you very much. Uh, for that, no, I, th- Ever- I think so-called journalist is referencing what uh, Wasserman Schultz called Taibbi. Oh, that was her. That's right. She called him a so-called, so-called journalist. journalist. Ah, that's right. I forgot that was her. I forgot yeah. that was her. Yeah. Um, that's correct. Uh, Everton Wright. 
This is where uh, you white people lose people of color. What's your parameter for it worked and for who? Not for the people who look like me. It has zero value. Are you talking about the Western civilization part of the conversation? You may have been there. Let me read another uh, might piece be of this. About that. Maybe talking about that. Let me read another piece because you followed it up. And thank you, Everton. There's no, yeah, that's uh, what I suspected. There's no factual premises that says Western culture has any value. What you like about the West was taken from the Moors. Greeks studied uh, in Africa. I mean, I, mean, I think that's that's, a, that's that's fucking nonsense. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, oh, so there were other antecedent cultures that inspired some of the ideas, not by any means all, but some of the ideas of the West. So everything that happened over the successive 2000 years has no value. Like, what are you even saying? Come on, stop it. Everton Wright says, again, the West used the knowledge to hide behind. <laughs> they have been acted in an enlightened sense. It's always been genocide and death cloaked in enlightening PLP. That's why PLP. People. What? Yeah, people. Yeah. Enlightening people, right? I don't know. It says PLP. That's why PLP say the West is That's what uh, people. Yeah. unique uh in it's evil okay so everton i'm gonna i'm gonna give you some history that i'm sure you know you're a very intelligent guy so the longest um the longest lasting slave trade in history was the arab slave trade it went from about uh 600 a.d until about the 1960s and um back in the day guess what guess what their practice used to be so wherever you had um, Arab slave trading um, centers, you had castration centers because it was uh, customary for them to chop your balls off after they took you as a slave uh, so that you would be a eunuch. Now, many of the slaves that they took over the centuries were both European and African. Many committed suicide after being unmanned in such a manner. Now, am I arguing to you, well, the Arabs were worse? No, not real. I mean, if you have balls as a man, if you if you ask any man, who would you rather be taken by the slave traders who are going to chop off your balls or the slave traders who won't? You're going to pick the ones who won't. Either way, it's horrific and it's horrible. But to portray the West as uniquely prone to such behavior, to cruelty, barbarity, to invasion, to colonization, to enslavement. It's just not historically true. It is just not true. And to say that the accomplishments of the West in science, philosophy, art, um, have not had great achievements alongside their horrors that the West has inflicted on the world, like every other civilization, like every other culture that reached a sufficient level of material prosperity and military uh, ability has done. It's, it's just not a, it's just not a credible thing to say. And why is that important? This is what I always say. Why is it important? Why do I keep bringing this up? Because if you think that the problem of humanity is whiteness or westernness boy are you going to be fucking surprised when you change the cast of characters and you have the same fucking problems okay <laughs> because it's not a problem of the west it's a problem of human beings uh all right jay thomas thanks for the 199 stochastic terrorism thank you uh we've been yelling at the world to wake up, the system will off you also. It's just a matter of time. They are seeing it now. PLC know this reality already. Well, that yeah, we agree on. I agree. I agree with you. Um, sorry. I hope I didn't just sus block or ban or put in timeout the last super chatter, but I might have. If I did, it's an accident. I'll go in and I'll fix it. Um, Everton, thank you. The people Kissinger off would not agree with Douglas Murray's ideology. No, of course not. The West inflicts unique evil on the world that only Western people can't understand. You know, that's a really that's a really interesting example that you brought up. How do you think those people got to Southeast Asia? Where do you where do you think they started out geographically? They started out in China. They were driven out by the Chinese who predominantly populate that area today. That is how they wound up there. Originally they were one of many different hundreds of tribes and language groups that populated that region until they were driven out <laughs> okay like this is not unique to the west it simply is not 
And that doesn't in any way take away what Kissinger did. All right. Like both things can be true at the same time. This this kind of just this kind of very two dimensional thinking does not bring us to a truthful place. Uh, we should have a constitutional convention and suspend the election. We're past having election to what vote in Israel again. Well, yeah, you got no no uh, no good options there for sure. Uh, and, thank hey, you, man, in, in the end, maybe this is something we can agree on. It looks like I'll be writing a Dave Chappelle again. So can I get a second? Yeah. Everton, you're going to join me in my crusade to make Dave Chappelle the president? Bernie Kostner, thank you for the $5. Great freaking show. Appreciate that thank very you. much. Um, Ronald Godwin, Thomas Frank. Uh-oh, I just flagged that because why do people have it in their head that I hate Thomas Frank? I, I didn't <laughs> I, I don't hate Thomas Frank. That's that's a, Well, because it's a running gag I keep pulling. <laughs> yeah, because, because Russell was afraid. <laughs> Russell was afraid that I alienated Thomas Frank. Quintessential. I'm HK, a fanboy. I admit it. Thanks for the twenty-five. Uh, whatever those are. Uh, ask Matt to analyze Russian politics and why people are allergic to Mearsheimer's points in U.S. blob ideologues or pure cynics. Is Elon money genius uh, or idiot? Well, we got to some of those, right? I mean, we got to the Elon thing. Uh, we talked. We were thinking about doing a little Russia Ukraine uh, with Matt, uh, but we we ran two and a half hours as it was. Yeah, we didn't. Um, we didn't want to because that would have opened up a whole other thing. But thank like you. Like he, he was already having to face the music with his family there. <laughs> yeah, that's why I asked him. I've halfway, you know, toward the end, I said, "Are you good?" Uh, Dave Delarai, thanks for the 10 bucks. Remember when Julian Assange worked with The Guardian to reveal the Iraq war logs? Yes. Then they threw him under the bus, or rather stood by while the U.S. did to him what they have done to him. Yes, indeed. Um, that is true. John Chemist, thanks for the 20 bucks. I learned of you guys on Jimmy Dore. You guys rock. Many thanks for the insight and candor. Well, thank you, John Chemist. Thank you, Appreciate John. that. Thank you, John. Very, very much. Folks, we're finishing up our... Uh, questions in the chats here and then we are going to rumble for our q a after this so we will be there shortly bonzo bean says what a waste of thumbs that are opposable to make machines that are disposable and sell them to seagulls flying in circles around one big right wing yes the left wing was broken long ago by the slightest of coins pro and now it's so hard to have faith in anything your next bold move Ani defranco 2001 album Reckoning. I remember that album actually. That was a good one. I was not a huge Johnny DeFranco fan, but she has some some good stuff, and uh, that was a good album. You're correct. Thank you, Mac Truck. Thanks for the five bucks. Great to see DD and Matt drill down on these topics. Well, thank you, Mac Truck. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Ernest Dosen. Street corner activism reaches thousands of people from all political perspectives. Podcasting is a powerful tool, but it tends to reach a far less diverse audience, preaching mostly to the choir uh that is i think true and and untrue i mean it is true that mathematically like uh we had a lot of engagement on the stream tonight but no there's no substitute for in the streets activism uh not at all not at all wait, i mean wait. thank god for all the industry the in the streets activism now well you know up here in up here in harlem you've got uh muhammad says i think is the name of their paper you got the nation of islam still does it the old school way, man. You see them on the corners distributing the paper. I've all, I, I've often said that part, I almost said it in this interview, but we had enough going on. Um, the internet is both an opportunity and a trap. Um, back in the day when you handed out pamphlets and leaflets, that was the only way to get that kind of information. Um, so people went to those sources for that information. Then when the internet came around, it gave you the opportunity to be exposed to a much wider audience, but it also made you vulnerable to censorship in a way that you never were before. Right? So now we're all in here and we're trapped. It's like we're, 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 we're locked in here with the likes of Elon and Debbie Wasserman Schultz and all the rest of the people who want to determine what you can say and not say here. And that wasn't the case before. But now that we're here, you can't go back. Right. Uh, Sean Brock, say the quiet part out loud. What does a closed border mean? Were you talking to somebody else? Because I know some people were upset that you kept saying the same thing over and over again. So was this because this super chat didn't have anything to do with what we were talking about. More ICE DHS funding, more detention centers, IDF, a wall. 
clubbing Haitians. You know, I, I've I've noticed a little bit in the comments. I think this is a carryover from our, our appearance on Jimmy when we were talking about immigration, and we were talking about the fact that you can't just have no. But I know I watched during the chat that some people were saying Sean Brock was saying the same thing over and over again, and he said I'm not spamming. I'm just trying to get my message out, and so maybe that's why I put a super chat on it. So it'd be more. Visible. Yeah, but I'm saying I think he's. I think this. Maybe. I think I saw him say this in the comments. Oh, that right. the, that this was carried over from the Jimmy Dore appearance. Well, I don't necessarily believe in a closed border. I don't know. My point in that segment was that neoliberalism makes this problem impossible to solve under these terms. Like, that was my point. Like, and this is why it's a powerful issue for the right. Because um, under a neoliberal economic order where 90% of all new wealth, I mean, look, Bernie talked about this all the time. People made fun of him for repeating himself. But this is the whole ball game right here. It's like two Corinthians, really. It's, this is the whole ball game right here. <laughs> it's when 90% of all new dollars get sucked up by the top 1% of earners, uh, you do not have the conditions under that system to support a liberal, a liberal policy at any border, right? I mean, you can't have a liberal immigration policy under that economic dynamic because there's too many people scrounging for too little resources for too few right. dollars right and so under that situation when you bring 12 million more in it creates problems for the lower 90 percent of earners who are fighting for the the uh nine percent of remaining percentage of wealth right sorry my, Exa my, too many exactly. numbers in my head to say that as clearly as i should have but you get the point and and what jimmy was saying what, what, whatever you think about the policy, what Jimmy was saying, I would agree with. Look, man, you think these people fucking really can't stop people flowing in over the border? That's ridiculous. Okay, with the military budget we have, you're telling me they can't, they can't stop people coming over the border. So, so let's dismiss that idea out of hand. So the fact that this is happening means they want it to happen. So why do they want it to happen? Is it your experience that this government wants to help working people? Is that your experience? Yeah, they want to create chaos. They want to create disruption in the labor market, and they want to suppress wages. That is not the fault of these migrants. And the left, another point I was making in that segment, the left needs to find a uh, way to defend its position that does not involve calling everybody who has those kinds of concerns a racist, because that, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. All you do with that, look at, look at, um, what's his name? G Kurt Wielders, whatever his name is over in uh, Holland, who just won. I mean, that's what you're going to get. If you, if all you do to address the concerns of working people like that is call them a racist, they're going to elect the next person who promises to protect them, not only from immigration, but from you, from right. you. All right. Um, so thank thank you for that, Sean. Sorry, I saw you posted a follow up. How is that accomplished without violence and oppression? It's not, but neither is this. Like that that that's my point. That's my point is that neoliberalism, capitalism, if you want to put it that way, makes this problem unsolvable. You can't have an economic model based on scarcity, and then say it doesn't matter how many people are here and how many more people come in. Because the economic model is scarcity. The economic model is a right, rat race exactly. or scratch. Exactly. Now, if you change the economic model, not just here, but in South and Central American countries as well, then you can have a different conversation. Then you can talk about solutions. Until then, the problem is unsolvable. That's why the issue is a gift to, to the right. Uh, Nelson Carrero, thanks for the $5. Always enjoy listening to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Jeff Berg, thank you. thank you. Appreciate you very much. Um, let's go here. All right, so what we're going to do, I'm going to read these last three Rumble Rants. This is the last call for Rumble Rants since we do have to start our Q&A. Any other Rumble Rants past this point will be read in the Q&A portion on Rumble. All right, how's that? Uh, if you're willing to divulge, yeah, why not? We've done enough of it already. <laughs> what sort of agreement contract exists between someone like Matt Taibbi when he comes on as a guest? Uh, none. We asked. Hey, uh, come well, on? we. On. I, I mean, I mean, we. Um, <laughs> so there's a there's a place in uh, New York. You know, we both live in New York in Wood Park, and um, you know, he's a little squeamish. Usually, we would sacrifice a goat. 
but yeah, he right. negotiated <laughs> us down to um to some hamsters. Yeah. So it's like five tonight. This time it was five hamsters, and um, we pledge our eternal allegiance to Beelzebub. And uh, then he does the show, and everything goes okay. You know, our dark lord approves. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, the way that all works is uh, we're all just kind of pals. We come on each other's show because uh, we like it. Um, but thank you. South Jersey guy says we good send answer, a, We guys. send them an email. We send yeah, them we send them an email. email. <laughs> uh, I'm so relieved Keaton and Russell aren't Greta fans. You scared me a little. How dare you? How dare you? Says Greta. Thank you, South Jersey guy. Glad you approve. Um, we don't want to alienate the South Jersey audience. You guys are rough deals. Fuck Warren Westell shit. lives on deal. Boom. Closed. All right. I'm voting for Dr. Shiva. How's that? How's that? <laughs> shake on it. Shake on uh, it. Shake on it. Shake on it. Um, somebody asked, just just to address the elephant in the room, somebody asked if I took ivermectin. All right. So I, I only had like an expired COVID test around the house and it came up negative, but I don't know, man. The symptom cycle is so weird and it's going on for seven days now. Yeah, it's probably the coof. I'll never know, but it, it seems like it probably is. Yeah, and he wouldn't dream of taking that I word because, uh, as we all know, follow CDC it's not guidelines. Safe and effective, right, yeah. follow CDC <laughs> guidelines to a T and don't ask questions. That's our motto here at the Force Compliance Podcast. That's um, right. <laughs> Everton. All right, I'm going to read these two, Everton, and then I'm going to make you an offer. All right, I, I'm serious. I, I'm serious about this. Slavery is not the bar. When they chopped off your balls, they didn't say it's for cultural or social benefit. Uh, that's the difference. And no, they started out in Africa, not China. I'm not disagreeing with you. I just look deeper. Like there's Chinese culture found in Mexico are Mexican Chinese. Okay, so started out in Africa. I assume what you mean is we all originally started out in Africa. I assume that's what you mean by that. Because the people in Southeast Asia were driven south by the invasion and dominance of of the... Of the uh, gene pool that dominates china to this day the han chinese i believe um and uh what was the second part of that well that was the second part of that it was it was just oh right well yeah. okay so they were so they were pushed down there yeah i don't know what the L- listen listen I listen everton man you know these days you don't want to assume people's gender identities and shit but i'm assuming that you have a pair of balls don't tell me that's a negligible element of the equation, motherfucker. No, but that's not what he's, he didn't say it was. Balls, that's, that's, not, pretty, that's not fair. He didn't say it was negligible. Core, but but uh, that's that's not fair, though. He did not say it was negligible. Uh, well, I, I, well, I don't. Well, what exactly? Well, what exactly are you <laughs> saying? Are you are you saying it's okay because what? Like, like what, what point are you? I don't even understand what your point is. Now. All right, let me get like, through these, or I'm going to chop It's not as bad because what they didn't make you. They didn't make you Christian or something. I mean, they probably did make you Islamic. You know, I mean, like, what are you even talking about? Joe B, thanks for the two bucks. Russ, foe is the answer to your current ailments. Yeah, foe is good. Foe is good. That bone broth, very good for the immune system. Uh, really enjoyed the interview. Thanks, Zach Boyles. I've been missing almost everything lately. Been trying to prep for this dystopia discussed tonight, though. Uh, feels impossible. Yeah, you. where have you been, Zach? You haven't been here in a while, my friend. Um, but good to see you back. Good to see you back. Um, I've seen you in the in the Jimmy chats a, a little bit, but not, uh, not here um, in a while. But thank you, my friend. Good to see you again. Uh, all right. Russell, says Everton, you have this knee-jerk YR. I don't know what YR, supremacist view of culture, and again, the rest of the world begs to differ. Your culture young, isn't the global Russ. majority. Oh, yeah? Supremacist view of culture. What is it? You keep taking it down before I can respond to it. And again, the rest of the world begs to differ. Your culture isn't the global majority. Everton, I didn't say Western culture was better. I just said it wasn't worse. That's all I said. I didn't say it was the majority. I didn't say it's better than any other culture. I, I said to argue that it's worse is just um, I, I find it I find it very um, silly, frankly. <laughs> it's just a silly way to look at the world. It's it's an incredibly naive reading and understanding of history to think that the evils of the West are unique to the West. Yeah, you have to just really be ignorant 
of history to believe that, or you have to distort history in such a way that you can justify that narrative to yourself. It, it just is not true. I wish it was. It would be simpler. All right, Everton, this is the last one because I don't want to keep taking your money and we have to switch over to Rumble. But my offer to you, Everton, is a sincere one. Um, I will send you an email since I have your email. But I would like to set up a call where we can record a conversation and maybe use it for the show. I think it would be good. Um, so I want you to hold me to that. I will send you an email. Uh, oh, they to did it? <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is the rest of the world did not coat their crimes in social justice or for the betterment of human civilization, human as in all PLP. Oh, my God. Like, have you actually read any of the writing of what previous civilizations said about themselves and the gloriousness of the cult of their cultures and the superiority of their cultures or the or the uh, the supremacy of the of the Persian ruler? And, and I mean, come on, man. what are you talking about? Where are you getting this from? It's just, none of what you're saying is true. It's not true. Every, every culture has done that. Uh, Russell, what makes people turn? Oh, wait, I broke my own rule. Um, in fact, I'm not going to break my own rule. We're going to take that over on Rumble because it's time for the Q&A. We're past the three hours. So, folks, we appreciate you all being here tonight. Please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button. Uh, if you're on Rumble, hit that follow button. If you're not on Rumble right now and you want to join us for our post-show question and answer talk back uh, session, go to rumble.com front slash do dissidents and uh, we will be the first one, the first video in the chat column. People ask us to post the link in the chat. We are very nervous to post links in chats on YouTube, especially the R word in the chat, uh, because things get to get spammed. Like YouTube tends to like the AI thinks you're spamming if, sometimes if you post a link in the chat and we don't want that to happen because then we won't be able to chat for however many days they put you in a timeout so rumble.com front slash do dissidents to join us for the q and a we will be over there after a five minute intermission if you're not joining us for the q and a we will be back on wednesday night at 8 p.m with matt taibbi's former co-host katie halper so a double header guest special this week and there's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about with her because there's a lot of stuff that we could have talked about tonight but obviously we had a great guest and a great time with matt taibbi so go to rumble.com front slash do dissidents if you want to hang out with us a little bit longer otherwise we will see you wednesday we want to thank matt taibbi once again for being here and we will see you all on wednesday night or if you want to join us in five minutes for a q a talk back rumble.com front slash do dissidents whenever we see you again or i should say until we see you again whenever that may be please of course be safe and be well you, you must be almost 30 have you, have you ever kissed a girl courage please clap